We are live in five, four, three, two, one. Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online. To introduce today's topic and speaker, I hand over to Dr. Satish Sona. Uh, good morning, friends. Uh, first of all, uh, happy Independence Day, day the seventy-fifth Independence Day, to each and everyone. I thank Professor Van Dyck and uh, Dr. Mark Bagney for accepting our invitation to participate in the webinar uh, on advances in the ankle uh, uh, surgeries. Uh, Professor Van Dyck doesn't need any introduction. He is a world-renowned and pioneer ankle foot uh, surgeon with so many innovative surgeries and uh, Can you hear? Hello. Yes, sir. You are you are audible. Hello. Yes, Satish. We can hear you now. Uh, Doctor Mark Blackney is yet to join. He has some issues with the network. Uh, uh, Doctor Samuel Patel is uh, one of the first dedicated anchor course surgeon. I am practicing in Pune, and uh, Doctor. Girish? Satish, Girish? Satish we, we can't hear you, sir, Satish, properly. There's some network issue. Yes, yes. Girish, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can hear you. Kindly you start uh, with uh, uh, Professor Nick's talk, and in between I will uh, start because there's issue with my network. Okay. okay. Uh, so may I request Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Nick to... Uh, to start your presentation and it will be great to learn from your session and I hope it will be the very, very good learning session. Professor Nick, please. Thank you so much um, <clears throat> for the invitation to participate uh, to this series of uh, webinars uh, that you, uh, uh, that the Indian Arthroscopy Society is, uh, is organizing and uh, this is uh, from Jaipur. This was the last last live meeting that uh, um, that I had um, because it was December 2019. It was a two-day course, and uh, uh, since then, uh, like I said, um, there were no live meetings any longer. Everything is now is on webinars. Even the Isakos uh, Congress at the end of this year, uh, Isakos decided to go. Um, to go uh, online, unfortunately, but hopefully next year we will be. Uh, uh, it will be possible to uh, to see each other live again. Hopefully, also uh, in 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 India. So the request was to talk about uh, posterior ankle arthroscopy and posterior ankle arthroscopy. Um, this was my first case. It was uh, I was in the OR and I was doing uh, I was doing an endoscopic. Uh, um, approach to the uh, uh, to the retrocalcaneal bursa because that's how I started and then there was a, a student in the OR and he said well can you show where is the subtalar joint and <clears throat> well um, I knew where about was the subtalar joint but I never went there so I said well it's somewhere here and then I went with my scope in front <clears throat> and then I saw the subtalar joint I said wow I can see the subtalar joint through these portals and then I saw the ostrigonum and then I saw the FHL and then I thought wow this is really this is really great and this is uh, many more indications than just uh, the retrocalcaneal bursa so from there um, I worked on uh, but the ostrigonum and the resection of it was the first um, was the first procedure I performed and basically was um, uh, it was this uh, medical student that induced it uh, by uh, uh, asking me to, um, to explore this uh, area in the patient. So from there, the indication expanded and we could go to the ankle joint. 
um, for a synovectomy or for loose bodies, an osteochondral defect. Uh, we could go to the subtalar joint for a fusion, uh, but also to the tendons, to the FHL, the Achilles tendon, the peroneal tendons, uh, posterior tibial tendon. But start at the basis, um, the main indication for hind foot endoscopy remains posterior ankle impingement. Posterior ankle impingement is a pain syndrome. It is a patient who has pain on uh, plantar flexion, forced hyperplantar flexion, and the cause is either a trauma in the past, like a supination hyperplantar flexion trauma, or it is by overuse. And you see on this, um, uh, on this x-ray, uh, lateral foot x-ray, what is uh, happening. There is an impediment, in this case it's an ostrigonum, and, and, and it's squeezed between the calcaneus and the um, distal part of the, of the, uh, of the tibia. <clears throat> so this is then um, um, the posterior ankle impingement, and the hyperplantar flexion test is the test which, when it's positive, the diagnosis is confirmed. So with a short um, a movement of the foot, we bring the ankle in forced plantar flexion, like, a, like this, and then if the patient recognizes the pain, if this is the pain that he experiences during his activity, if this is the pain that he wants to get rid of, then the diagnosis is posterior ankle impingement. When we make a lateral uh, x-ray of the ankle, um, often an ostrigonum is, um, is not disclosed because the ostrigonum is more on the lateral side. We have to make a 25 degree extra rotation view. You see that here the fibula now move backwards and now we see an ostrigonum when it's present. So this 25 degree posterior impingement view is helpful. Uh, to disclose an ostrigonum if it's present. And we published it in the journal of Isakos uh, a few years ago. The differential diagnosis. What is, uh, what can give this uh, positive hyperplantar flexion test? Well, it can be pathology in the ankle joint. It can be an osteophyte. It can be a loose body. It can be soft tissue impingement. It can be the ostrigonum. It can be a hypertrophic posterior tailor process. It can be pathology in the subtalar joint. Everything that is around this area can cause this posterior ankle impingement. And it's often combined with flexor halitus longus tendinitis. And the reason is in the anatomy. This is the ostrigonum, so this is posterior, this is anterior, this is lateral, this is medial. This is where the ostrigonum is situated. And there is a retinaculum going from the ostrigonum, from the posterolateral tailor process to the posteromedial tailor process. So if there is a problem with the um, um, a shift or uh, any issue with the uh, ostrigonum, then often the FHL is involved at the level of the posterior uh, ankle, FHL tendinitis. So the approach, the endoscopic approach. Patient is in the prone position. Um, um, the foot should be in a, um, in a, a vertical position. So um, normally people have a, a sort of X rotation in the hips. So that's why there is a support here in order to tilt the table slightly, in order to have the foot uh, in the vertical position. There's a support under the leg and we operate in a bloodless field. The portals, we bring the foot, and this is my hand, so I bring the foot in a 90 degree position. 90 degree position, so if you place a line through the sole of the foot and the lower leg axis, this should be 90 degree. And then we place a line through the tip of the medial malleolus parallel to the floor. And then the posterolateral portal is just touching the line on the lateral side. And the medial portal is opposite the lateral portal. So again, <clears throat> place the foot in the 90 degree position. Um, this is the tip of the lateral malleolus. So place the line through the tip of the lateral malleolus and then the Posterolateral portal is here, posterolateral medial portal is there. 
don't place it too close to the Achilles tendon in order not to uh, have the, um, the portals too close. It's more difficult to angulate. It's more easy to, to do the surgery like this and not like this. And the other reason is that you would do not want to damage the Achilles tendon. So this is how you look at the foot. It's the left foot uh, from the surgeon position. So we have, we have marked the uh, portals both lateral and medial on the skin. And now we go in with a mosquito clamp and we angle, we aim for the web space <clears throat> between the first and second toe. Then we exchange it for the scope. The light source is on the medial side, which means with a 30 degree um, uh, angle, uh, which we view, we look at the lateral side. Okay, but if we would look at the screen, then it would be a white screen because there is, we are still outside the joint, we are on the fascia. Then we place the um, uh, instrument um, um, uh, parallel or perpendicular to the scope. So we go in through the posteromedial portal uh, with this mosquito clamp. Uh, we touch the shaft of the scope and then we use the shaft of the scope as a guide to glide in front until we are in this position. So the scope is like this, looking at the lateral side. Okay, scope is like this, looking at the lateral side. Instrument is on the opposite side. Why do we do it like this? Because we don't want to damage the lens of the scope. Okay, but if we look at the screen, then there is a white screen because we are on the fascia. We don't see our instrument. Our instrument, if we follow those principles, is in the middle of the ostragonum. It's always in the middle of the ostragonum. <clears throat> That's the anatomy um, which brings us at the ostragonum. We don't see it because we're on the fascia, but the ostragonum is just behind it. Next step is that we want to visualize our um, mosquito clamp. So we leave the mosquito clamp in this position, and now we pull back the scope lift it and then we angle it and now we see the tip of our instrument here is the tip of our of our mosquito clamp and again the tip of the mosquito clamp the ostragon is right behind it now we exchange it for a shaver i use the 5.5 um, uh, bone cutter shaver routinely um, and this is to show in this anatomic uh, specimen where we are. So I took away the skin and the soft tissue, took away the Achilles tendon, you see the uh, remnant of the Achilles tendon. So this is then the fibula, <clears throat> the perineal tendons have been taken out. This will be the fibula, this will be the medial malleus, somewhere the talus, somewhere here um, is the ostragonum. So all these ligaments is the cruel fascia, and it is called the Rufier canella ligament. <clears throat> the Rufier canella ligament is this orange ligament, this part of the fascia, which goes from the fibula, attaches to the ostragonum, but it also attaches here to the, um, to the calcaneus, parallel to the um, fibulocalcanea ligament, and it attaches here to the uh, medial malleolus. So this all is the Part of the cruel fascia, it's called the Rufier canella ligament. And we are with our scope through the posterolateral portal, looking at it, at the fascia, and our instrument is right on the fascia, right on the ostragonum. The next step that we will uh, do is we make, uh, we punch, we push the shaver through the, um, the fascia in order to go to the subtalar joint. So this is the situation. We see the, um, uh, the shaver and now we push it through. We do a few turns of the shaver next to the subtalar joint. We pull it back and now we can see the subtalar joint. And here we see the subtalar joint, the subtalar joint. I will enlarge it for you. This is the subtalar joint and this is where we are. So we are in this part of the subtalar joint. This was the ostragonum. So our uh, shaver was like here. We pushed it through. Now we see 
this part of the subtalar joint. This is the posterior tailor fibular ligament. This is the tibial slip, the tibia, ankle joint, subtalar joint. This is the part where we will uh, work. So this is the view that we <clears throat> that we want to get at the end of our uh, when we cleaned everything. This is the view that we get, but we're not there yet. We are in this situation. The shaver is here on the uh, fascia. We push it in. We do a few turns of the shaver. If it's a dionic shaver, we go into the S of dionic, so it's one and a half centimeter. If it's an artrex shaver, it is to the X of uh, artrex. Um, we do a few turns, we pull it back, and then we will see the subtalar joint. Here again, we see the subtalar joint. And here now is our shaver. Because now we will, so the shaver will be here, we now will explore uh, and clean um, uh, this part in order to go to the FHL. So we want to go in this direction and then we are stopped by the FHL. Subtalar joint, shaver is here, we move it to the medial side and we stop when we see the FHL. Then from there we will go back and disclose the, the ankle joint. So here we have the ankle joint, FHL, and now we will finally clean the part um, around the flexor retinaculum. Here we have the flexor retinaculum and now we have the complete view. If you take, grab the big toe and move it up and down, now we see the muscle belly of the uh, FHL. And then we can cut the flexor retinaculum in case we want to do a release of the FHL. <clears throat> flexor retinaculum, which we are here cutting. So when we want to remove the ostrigonum, if this is an ostrigonum, we want to remove it. Then we have to detach three structures which are attached to the ostrigonum. First, the flexor retinaculum, then the posterior talocalcaneal ligament, that's this part, it goes in this direction, and finally the posterior talofibular ligament, which goes in this direction. Once we have uh, cut those three or released them, then we can grab the ostrigonum and remove it. So this is the posterior talofibular ligament, posterior talofibular ligament, and then when we go to the medial side, see the ostrigonum, FHL, we see the flexor retinaculum, we see the talocalcaneal ligament, and the first thing that we cut, like you see here, and you see here, is the flexor retinaculum. Once we cut it, we will cut the posterior talococcaneal ligament, like here. So now we did the release on the medial side. And then we will go to the posterior talofibular ligament, like we see here, the posterior talofibular ligament. And then we will use a elevator, a curved elevator, like you see here. And here you see it. We grab the ostragonum and then we can remove it. And this is then the end result. We have a good view in the subtalar joint um, and we can finish the procedure. So often a posterior ankle impingement is a combined pathology, combined with flexor halitus longus uh, tendinitis. The diagnosis is by the hyperplantar flexion test. Um, if you don't see an ostrigonum, on the standard um, uh, x-ray, lateral x-ray of the ankle, um, you can make a posterior impingement view. Of course, you can also make a CT scan, but um, it is cost effective to make this posterior impingement view. Overuse injuries do better than post-traumatic and bony do better than soft tissue. And we published the results of the outcome of our first 203 patients. Long-term follow-up, uh, with a high satisfaction and uh, a good function um, and only one and a half percent we had minor complication in those 203 patients. And this is to show that it is not only bony impingement but also soft tissue impingement. You see in plantar flexion the uh, ligaments 
especially when they are partially torn, thickened, when there is scar tissue in this area, you can imagine that the uh, soft tissue gets squeezed in between the uh, posterior tailor process or the ostrigonum and the uh, distal tibia. So it started with um, the ostragonum and the ostragonum resection, but the indications since then have uh, expanded. And like I was telling you with the first slide, you can go to the ankle joint to do a soft synovectomy. It's very rewarding to do a total synovectomy, uh, for example, in, in, in telenodular synovitis or in uh, other conditions in which you want to do a total synovectomy. You can do endoscopic first, the synovectomy posterior. Then I turn the patient, I do an anterior scope, and I do the anterior arthroscopy and the anterior synovectomy. Synovectomy is very effective being done arthroscopically. Those bodies here in the posterior part of the joint, more easy to remove by posterior uh, arthroscopy than go through the ankle from the front to the back and try to grab them. Uh, much more easy to do it from posterior. If those loose bodies are um, are fixed uh, to the soft tissue, of course, the ossicles much easier to go from the back. Osteogonal defect in the posterior third of the talus, medial lateral, um, you can go by uh, the hind foot approach. Subtalar joint impingement, osteogonum impingement is still the main indication for um, hind foot endoscopy. Sedel fracture, a very interesting indication. You know what is the Sedel fracture? It is the avulsion of the deep portion of the deltoid ligament. Um, it is in this area. It is just behind the neurovascular bundle, but you can very nicely go detach the uh, retinaculum of the FHL, move the FHL aside, then attach the uh, insertion of the same flexor retinaculum on the talus here. And then you are right on the Sedel fracture and you can with the periosteo elevator very elegantly detach it from above, from the medial side, from below and take it out. Release of the FHL, um, um, a clear indication, the retrococcaneal bursitis, I will talk about it in a, in a moment. Um, peroneal tendon, the debridement diagnostic. This is one of the few indications in which I, I do a diagnostic um, arthroscopy, endoscopy, tendoscopy to confirm a length rupture. Uh, but you can debride it, clean it, do a synovectomy as you can do with the posterior tibial tendon. So this is the observatorium in, uh, in Jaipur. Um, you obviously recognize it better than me. And that finishes my presentation. I'm not sure if you want me to continue straight away or if there's discussion. Maybe you can tell me about the format of this webinar. Uh, Girish, uh, can we take uh, a few questions on this topic? Yes, sir. Uh, congratulations, Professor Nick, for the wonderful talk. And I think you have made a good insights to the posterior ankle arthroscopy. Uh, uh, sir, few quick questions. Uh, so question one, uh, how many of the time you need to take out the os trigonomic piecemeal in spite of, uh, uh, you know, separating the os trigonum from various ligaments? Still many times we find the difficulty to take out the uh, os trigonum as a single piece. So what is your trick to, and how do you manage? Uh... Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, a large ostragonum, uh, I mean, for the beginning arthroscopist, don't start with a large ostragonum because then you run into the problem that you are, uh, that you are referring to. Uh, in my experience, a piecemeal, I can't remember that I ever done it, maybe once or twice. So I'm, basically, I, I try to avoid to do the piecemeal um, removal. And the trick behind it probably is, um, <clears throat> well, one, in the end, enlarge the portal. Um, that is clear because if it's large, you cannot go through the portal. So you have to enlarge it and not only enlarge the skin incision, but then go in with uh, um, forceps to also enlarge the fascia 
um, so that you really have a, a path in which it can uh, be distracted. Um, what is important to have a full release, um, and especially the um, posterior, uh, so, so the posterior uh, tail of uh, fibular ligament, that is the one um, who is difficult sometimes to uh, completely um, uh, remove. So once you have grabbed the ostrigonum, and you cannot discard, if it's large, then use a cocker forceps, so forceps with teeth, um, a normal a cocker forceps. And then you have a good hold on the uh, ostrigonum. Uh, make sure you're in the middle of it, not on the edge, on the middle. And then I turn it maybe 10, 20 times, uh, 30 times until the remnant of the ligaments really come loose. Um, so once you have turned it, then at a certain point of time it's loose and then you can distract it. That's the way I do it. Great. So you made a very good point that a beginner should not begin with the uh, ostrigonum arthroscopy. Uh, sir, next question is, uh, how often you need to release the retina film of the FHL? Um, well, just to correct uh, your the, the first question, um, as a beginner, start with a, with a relatively small ostrigonum, not with a large ostrigonum. I mean, ostrigonum is a very nice indication to start as a beginning arthroscopist, but don't go for the huge ostrigonum. FHL release, if you uh, have to remove an ostrigonum, in 100%, you have to do an FHL release because um, the retinaculum is attached to the um, to the ostrigonum. So you cannot remove an ostrigonum without detaching the um, retinaculum, and detaching the retinaculum means release of the FHL. Okay. So the last question: uh, How often? Uh, you did a dry arthroscopy of the posterior ankle. I mean, you have inserted a scope and you find nothing. Sorry, the question is uh, a dry arthroscopy? I mean, uh, no pathology was seen. Like pre-operative -pre diagnosis of the patient was posterior ankle impingement. And in, when you put a scope, you find nothing. Uh, I mean, nothing pathological. Um, that should never happen. Um, and uh, so the uh, important the important is to have um, the, the the correct preoperative workup. Your preoperative workup is vital. So you have to make a diagnosis before you start. So if the diagnosis is um, posterior impingement and you don't see an ostrigonum, maybe you make a, a CT scan. Yeah, then I will make a CT scan uh, most often because there might be small bony particles and it's usually the bony particles that are the problem and that you have to remove when there's a bony particle like a loose body or an ostrigonum or any other um, um, ossicle then usually that is the cause of the problem and you have to remove it but you did your work up and there is no bony particle then the uh, diagnosis and you posterior impingement test is positive then it is and maybe you've done an mri to rule out uh, an osteogonal defect in the ankle joint, there is no bone marrow edema, then the diagnosis is soft tissue impingement. And then you have to um, uh, take away the, um, uh, the intermalleolar ligament uh, and take away the soft tissue, um, which is blocking the, the posterior view. And you go to the ankle joint and just make a nice and clean uh, view. Um, so the preoperative diagnosis is vital. Thank you, sir. Um, Dr. Satish, uh, Dr. Sampat, sir, do you have any question or we can move to the next? Uh, uh, Professor Nick, uh, uh, do you use a normal 4mm scope or a smaller orthoscope for posterior ang uh, ankle orthoscopy? And secondly, the few basic tips to avoid injury to the FHL do, uh, while do, uh, uh, doing the posterior scope. Uh, I, I always use a four millimeter scope. I never use a smaller scope. Um, I want to have um, uh, a good flow. So I want to have a large um, shaft uh, in, in order to have a large um, shaver. I always use a 5.5 millimeter bone cutter shaver for all my posterior scopes. So a large shaver, large scope, big flow of, uh, of um, saline and um, uh, I think that is that is important. 
I only used a small diameter scope in big toe arthroscopy. Uh, and even a big toe arthroscopy, if you don't have it available, you can do it with a, with a four millimeter scope, but it's a little bit challenging, I must admit. So um, a large diameter scope. Uh, FHL, um, if you, the way to prevent damage to the FHL is to start on the lateral side. And that's what I tried to show in my approach. If you start in a safe area by recognizing the anatomy, the safe area is the subtalar joint on the lateral side because it is the, it is far away from um, the area that you want to avoid, and that's a neurovascular bundle. So start posterolateral at the subtalar joint, and then make your way to the FHL. Once you're at the FHL, then you know what is your working area, and then you can just stay lateral from the FHL. And in this way, you will never um, uh, damage the FHL. The other thing is that if you use the large diameter shaver, which I use, and you are, so the shave, the opening of the shaver is in, in this direction, and here's the, here's the FHL, then don't go with the opening towards the FHL. When you, when you go closer to the FHL, um, turn your shaver, so that the back of your shaver is towards the FHL. So the more you go to the medial side, the more you will always have your shaver like this. When you're more in the away from the FHL, then you can use the shaver like this. And if you're lateral, you can use it like this. But always, when you're near to the FHL neurovascular bundle, shaver always like this. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, Sampa, sir. No. Do you have any questions, sir? No, no, we'll go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, Very good. Professor Nick, uh, can we have your next session? Uh, is the management yes. of the talent? Okay, so you are going with the Achilles tendinopathy first. Okay. Yes, to the retrococcane bursitis because it automatically follows from um, from the posterior uh, scope. And this is to show my affiliation. I worked in the academic medical center till 2016. Then I was retired in the AMC and now I work in the FIFA Medical Center in Madrid and in, in Porto. Um, the Achilles tendon pathology can be divided in non-insertional and insertional. And uh, the question, your question was to uh, talk about the regional cocaine bursitis and the insertional tendinopathy. So on the right you see um, you see, or on the left, you see a patient. This is a patient with retrocalcaneal uh, bursitis. If you make an x-ray, a lateral x-ray, um, then you can see in a patient with a retrocalcaneal bursitis, uh, you can see that the soft tissue is more whitish, gray, uh, compared to a patient who has no retrocalcaneal bursitis than this part of the Kager triangle, this is called the Kager triangle. This should be the blackest part of this triangle. And when it is grayish, and it is a retrocalcaneal bursitis. We published it, and it is very, very uh, sensitive. Um, if it is uh, black, then there is no retrocalcaneal bursitis. If it's grayish, it's a retrocalcaneal bursitis. You don't need an MRI. Uh, you can just have a lateral X-ray to confirm if there is a retrocalcaneal bursitis, yes or no. It has a very high sensitivity specificity. Michael van Sterkenberg, one of my PhDs, he published it in the American Journal of Sports Medicine a few years ago. The approach, um, patient again is in the prone position. The portals are one and a half centimeter more distal from the hind foot portals. Okay, so if you would place the lines through the tip of the uh, lateral malleolus, like I showed you with the hind foot uh, endoscopy, then go one and a half centimeter distal, and then you're right on the, um, the, the portal that you use for, uh, for endoscopic calcaneoplasty. The scope, again, I use a large diameter scope because the advantage of the large scope is that the scope in itself lifts the tendon from the bone. So you create a space. If you use a small scope, there is only a small space in between the Achilles tendon and the bone. But with a large scope, you automatically create um, a space. Um, the opposite portal, um, 
um, made in the usual way. Again, I use the 5.5 millimeter bone cutter shaver. For me, there's only one shaver that you can use. I never use an acromionizer. I never use a burr. I use the 5.5 millimeter um, uh, bone cutter shaver. And again, if you are make sure that the opening of the shaver is always towards the bone, then you can really nicely round off um, the calcaneus. So this is a very early um, uh, picture in which uh, uh, we used a burr, but I never use a burr um, over the last 20 years. Uh, because the problem with the burr is that you can also get the soft tissue into the burr. It is more easy to flip off. Uh, it is more less easy to make a really nice round um, uh, calcaneus like you want because you want to make it like a ball in this direction and in this direction. So here you see um, um, the bursa, the inflamed bursa between the Achilles tendon and the uh, calcaneus. Here you see the uh, Achilles tendon, here you see the neovascularization, which is always in the area uh, opposite the superior uh, border of the calcaneus. So there is an impingement. If you dorsiflex, you will see an impingement between the Achilles tendon and the uh, calcaneus. And when you go down to the insertion here at the air bubble, that is where is the insertion of the Achilles tendon to the, uh, to the calcaneus. So this is the view that you would get. This is the preoperative um, uh, x-ray with the calcaneus, the prominence of the calcaneus. And here you see during the surgery the Achilles tendon. Here is where the Achilles tendon attaches to the uh, calcaneus. Here you see the calcaneus. And this is the part of the bone that we want to remove. So on the x-ray it would look like this. Um, and this is halfway the procedure I already uh, removed on uh, the medial part, the, um, the bone, and now I changed the portal so I can see what I did. Um, I still have to remove that part of the bone. This part is already okay. I still have to remove the lateral part. So here's my shaver on top of the uh, prominence that is still there, and I have to remove it up to the uh, imaginary line that I made and then this is the nicely rounded off calcaneus that you want to see in the end and this is the um, this is the x-ray uh, as you see it uh, after you have done your surgery then to the insertional um, um, pathology the insertional tendinopathy the uh, pain is at the uh, insertion of the achilles tendon the retro calcaneal bursitis pain on uh, physical examination is, is higher up, but here we have the pain, recognizable tenderness on palpation at the insertion. Uh, if you make an x-ray, we see the calcification. Um, my approach is usually by a midline incision. Um, I identify the calcification and I cut it out. If it is less than 50% of the width of the insertion, you don't have to reinsert. You can just close the Achilles tendon and that's it. You have to reinsert, so deinsert and reinsert, if you have a calcification that is more than 50% of the width of the overall insertion, and then you uh, reinsert it um, uh, like I, I showed you. Um, and this again is the step well, um, which I was very, I was amazed by this. Uh, um, architecture of the step well near uh, Jaipur, and it was the last. It was it was the last. Uh, the introduction of the last presentation that I had in Jaipur, uh, so that was really my last live presentation. And uh, um, I want to uh, draw your attention to the Ankle Platform website because uh, all the techniques that I showed you. They are uh, freely available on the um, on the on the website, um, uh, and of course more techniques for ankle arthroscopy. Um, there were still some advertisements for uh, these courses. This was the course the week before the Jaipur course, so the second last course. I hope that we will be able to uh, 
we'll do more courses also in India in the in the near future. Thank you for the attention, and if there's questions, I will be happy to uh, to address them. Uh, Professor Thank Nick, uh, do, do you use uh, a fluoroscopy uh, during the procedure? Yes, if I have, uh, if I am in doubt, then I use fluoroscopy. And I would advise you, if you are starting with these procedures, uh, at the end of your procedure, use fluoroscopy to check if you have done enough. And uh, sometimes you're surprised that you were, um, that there's really not enough bone taken away yet. So I would advise you to do it in your first procedure, Make become comfortable with it. And once you're comfortable, then you don't do it. So I do it very seldom, but uh, if it's a really large one, if it's a professional athlete, um, uh, then I usually will do it. Professor Nick, uh, Dr. Rajkumar, you want to ask how much time you wait before intervening the surgery, uh, uh, before going to surgery in case of insertional Achilles tendinosis and retrocritical bursitis. I mean, what is your conservative management? Yeah, conservative management is uh, basically these patients, when they come to me, they have already uh, complained for uh, years. And uh, um, I try not to treat them with um, uh, corticosteroid injection because the corticosteroid injection will weaken the tendon. And uh, so usually these patients have um, uh, at least a year of uh, conservative treatment before they come to me. And then um, uh, I will discuss with them the, 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 the arthroscopic procedure, which is a relatively small procedure. And uh, um, yeah, so, for me, the conservative treatment already has been done before. Sonar, can I ask uh, one more question, please? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Professor Nick, this is Dr. Rajkumar Amrati from Bangalore St. John's. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity given to participate in this wonderful meeting. Sir, do you see frequently these kind of insertional tendinopathy and bursitis in uh, diabetics or seronegative arthritis? Because we have a set of people here in down south, wherein fluorosis is a very common uh, condition. And uh, we see a lot of these kind of uh, insertional tendinopathies and bursitis. So your thoughts on that, sir? Yeah, well, the... the um... The, insert, the, the calcification, the, the spurs, you see a lot. And uh, I would say 99% of the spurs that you see or the calcifications are asymptomatic. And uh, so it's only, you treat only those uh, spurs, those uh, insertional spurs when they become symptomatic and when they don't respond to conservative treatment, supervised neglect or um, physiotherapy or a, a heel raise or well, all those treatments that, that they had before. Um, but um, once they become symptomatic, then it is, they're not very easily in my uh, experience. Well, I see the patient that, that don't react to conservative treatment, basically. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 the incidence of those spurs is very high. Uh, maybe the incidence of retrococaneal bursitis in my practice or it's not that high. Um, so I, I, I cannot tell you about the incidence of retrococaine bursitis in, in Western Europe. Um, but apparently, like you say, in India, it's quite high. Uh, Dr. Nick, one last question. Uh, what is your cutoff uh, for the open, I mean, uh, excision of the uh, insertional Achilles tendinosis uh, and for the arthroscopy, like beyond what you go for the open repair. Yeah, well, for the when it's isolated, uh, I, I always, with my physical examination, uh, try to dif differentiate between uh, uh, reticocaine bursitis and insertional tendinopathy. Um, because you have a lot of patients with reticocaine bursitis that also have spurs. But if you investigate them really well, then their pain is from the retrococaine bursitis and 
and and it's not that the, the, the spurs are really recognizably tender in the sense that they say, well, this is my main problem. And then I will, so if the main problem is the retical cranial bursitis, then I try to only do the endoscopical canioplasty. I try to differentiate between the two, if possible. Sometimes it's not possible, and then it's both. It is endoscope, then it is retical cranial bursitis and insertional, uh, and then I do it open. Uh, and then I go through the tendon, uh, like I showed you, I make a longer incision through the tendon, I split the tendon, and then I do the, um, I do the, uh, the hack looms, I do it uh, open through the tendon, okay? Um, so, isolated retrococcanial bursitis, I will never do open. Um, and I do them also, um, I have also quite a number of patients with a failed open uh, endoscopic cocaineoplasty, then I will do it, I will do it the second time, um, arthroscopic, endoscopic. So it doesn't matter for me what, if it's a primary or secondary procedure, I will always do it all, because I can just do a much better job. It is, uh, uh, it is more quick, it is more uh, friendly for the patient, and I can just do a better job. With the, uh, with, the, uh, with the shaver and the scope. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I ask one more question, Dr. Girish? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, Professor, it was very nice of you to show that uh, only an X-ray is enough to uh, diagnose a bursitis in an ankle. Uh, posteriorly, it was wonderful. Are you aware of any radiological finding called as the AX effect described by our uh, hospital? In no, no. We have described a radiological finding called as the AX effect in uh, posterior uh, calcinopathies that we see, uh, especially in fluorotic uh, patients. Are you aware of that? No, tell me. No, this gen generally we have seen in a case that we have recorded in the literature and published in Journal of Orthopedic Surgery wherein this gentleman had a post-septic uh, sequelae following diabetes and fluorosis superimposed. So the calcaneal bursa was, and the calcaneal uh, what, ossification was so huge that it uh, simulated an axe that generally a mythological character in our Hindu mythology uses called as the axe of the Parshuram. So we have coined the term called as the axe effect. Are you aware of that literature? That's what I wanted to know. Uh, no, but please uh, send me uh, the article. That would be nice. That would be wonderful. I'll share with you that literature and uh, hope it will be of some use. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Nick, can we have your last talk, uh, management of Tyler OCD or... Uh, you need us to move to the other talk for some break. Um, yes, the treatment of Taylor OCD. What if uh, biological options uh, uh, failed? And I mentioned the Journal of Isocos. I'm the editor in chief of the journal. So, this last publication that I was not aware of, um, if you would have published it in the Journal of Isocos, I would certainly would have been aware of it. Uh, but anyway, if there is any, any research that you want to share, uh, we're indexed in PubMed, uh, Medline, so um, uh, feel free to uh, to uh, submit your articles uh, to the Journal of Isocos. Sure, thank you. Sir. Osteogondal defect. Purpose of the treatment is to prevent osteoarthritis and to resolve the symptoms, but we know that the natural history is bind, uh, benign for the smaller uh, lesions. We don't have to treat them uh, to prevent uh, osteoarthritis. So the main reason to treat is to resolve the patient's symptoms and the main symptom of the patient is pain. It is deep ankle pain on walking. And the reason for the pain is that on every step of walking, the content of the cartilage, which is mainly water, is compressed into the subchondral bone, leading to bone marrow edema on the T2 image, uh, which you see on the left. And Professor when the pressure the interruption uh, your screen is freeze so we are not able to see your screen ah oh how to come ah it was paused um so how do i share so you need to share the screen again 
Yeah, it's, uh, so is it shared now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. please go ahead. Okay. So you missed the most important. Uh, you missed the most important, and that was the Journal of Isikos. Nevertheless, <laughs> um, here I showed you the the cause of the pain. So the, on every step of walking, um, there is this um, uh, content of water compressed into the subchondral bone, leading to the bone marrow edema, persisting bone marrow edema on the uh, on the T2 image. And since it is a very congruent joint, uh, the water cannot go into the joint space, so it goes into the bone, leading to the cystic lesions. You see cystic lesions not in incongruent joints like the knee joint, you only see it in congruent joints like the hip joint and, and, and especially in the, in the ankle joint. And the pressure in the cyst and the pressure on the walking, like here, is detected by the nerve endings, which are colored red. Um, and these are the ones that are, that are uh, innervated um, uh, and that cause the pain, the deep ankle pain on walking. The treatments of, um, of osteochondral defects. Um, Non-operative treatment has a 50% chance of uh, success. Excision of a fragment, if there's a fragment, also 50%, that's not good enough. You need to curettage or at least go to uh, stimulate the bone marrow, let it fill with stem cells, and then it will uh, repair with fibrocartilage. Anterograde drilling, uh, leaving the cartilage intact um, is not a good idea. You have to remove the cartilage, really open, um, uh, open it in order uh, to be able to destroy this mechanism of, of this pressure um, uh, into the subchondral, uh, subchondral bone. AC and MAC um, um, have almost the same uh, on the same uh, percentage of good excellent result as those, but not better, uh, of, of uh, uh, bone marrow stimulation, but not better. So it's questionable if we need to do it. Uh, it is costly. It makes better cartilage, hopefully. Um, so maybe on the long term, it's okay. It is better uh, for the long longevity, for, to prevent osteoarthritis, but on the short term, uh, to get rid of the complaints of the patient, it doesn't help you because the pain is in the bone, and the treatment of the bone is um, helpful to get rid of the of the pain. So oats, you treat the bone and the cartilage gives good result. Retrograde drilling, you treat the bone, you fill it with uh, uh, the cyst with with bone has good results. Fixation, you fix the bone and the cartilage. So the treatments with the uh, which are colored orange, who treat not only the cartilage but the bone have the highest percentage of good excellent results. And what I want to introduce to you is the concept of edge loading. I, you have to think when you treat an osteochondral defect of this concept of edge loading. If you understand the concept of edge loading, I believe it will help you in making your uh, decisions. So I will explain you what I mean. This is a preoperative CT scan. It was from a, a research project that we did a few years ago. Um, we did preoperative CT, then at two weeks postoperative, and then at a year to see what was happening. So this is directly postoperative at two weeks. And now I turned apparently uh, a normal size lesion into a critical size lesion. A critical size lesion meaning that now it is one and a half centimeter in diameter. And what does it mean? It means that the pressure is on the edge of this defect. So the larger the defect, the more pressure there will be on the edge of the defect um, and this can lead to problems and we see it at one year where is the problem where is the new uh, cyst it is not under the defect because there's less load under the defect the load is under the edge of the defect and now there is a new cystic lesion Schematically, this is an osteogonal defect, uh, one centimeter diameter. Um, we take it away. It will fill with fibrocartilage, with stem cells from uh, the bone marrow. A new uh, subchondral bone um, uh, plate will uh, form. And this is a happy patient in general with uh, bone marrow stimulation procedure. 
In a larger size defect, like one and a half centimeter, initially it's the same. It will fill with fibrocartilage. But now the pressure is on the edge, leading to higher pressure here, maybe a little bit higher pressure here and here. Um, and maybe if it is the pressure is high enough, maybe a new cyst, like I showed you. If this continues, then we might have more cyst, more pressure, maybe a cyst on the opposite side. We sometimes see it. We sometimes see it in the medium malleolus, sometimes in the lateral malleolus. And then the end situation is something like this. So edge loading, I believe, is important. And with our treatment, we need to prevent edge loading. So for example, with a metal implant, and I will discuss it because it's a new uh, procedure. Um, this is what happens. The uh, implant takes part of the load away from the edges, but also with your other treatment. Bear in mind that you want to have a filling that helps protect the edges from crumbling down. So what determines um, um, what we treat? Because there's a variety of treatment options. The size of the lesion uh, matters, whether it's a primary or secondary surgery and the age of the patient. So this is my treatment algorithm. Asymptomatic lesions, I treat conservative. Symptomatic lesions, uh, up till 50 millimeter excision curatized bone marrow stimulation. The larger lesions, I fix them. I do an oats or this metal implant. For the large cystic lesions, I go for retrograde drilling. And for the secondary lesions, mainly I go for oats. I go for an osteotomy if the alignment is not good, or I choose the uh, metal implant. So you see that the size of the uh, lesion matters in my choice for treatment. And whether it's a primary lesion or a secondary lesion, that makes difference in the way that I choose my uh, treatment. So when do we treat? We treat when the patient is symptomatic. How do we know that it's symptomatic? Uh, an MRI is helpful because it's a biological um, investigation. If there is bone marrow edema, there is a high correlation with the pain. There is activity and that is uh, correlating with pain. So MRI is helpful in, um, uh, in helping you to decide if this lesion is um, the cause of the pain, yes or no. How do we do it? Um, well, you can do it with distraction. Uh, I prefer bringing the ankle in plantar flexion and treat my osteochondral defect in the anterior working area. Sometimes I need uh, uh, um, I need an osteotomy. In case of an oats, um, I need an uh, osteotomy. Preoperative planning is important because how do we know if we can reach this uh, lesion in plantar flexion. If you make a CT in plantar flexion, you see that the joint opens up in plantar flexion, so you can have access to this defect. This is the situation that you will get during your surgery. So if you have this sagittal view of a plantar flex CT, then you know, okay, this is during the surgery. This is my distal tibia. So here starts my osteogonal defect, and you can palpate the cartilage and you can detect it. So your preoperative planning is uh, is vital. This metal implant, uh, we um, uh, started with it some 12 years ago and published uh, two years ago on the first 52 patients. And it will were all secondary procedures. All these patients had surgery before. And the survival rate was still 94%, which I thought was really very promising. However, there were some problems with this uh, implant. The osteotomy was uh, imprecise. Uh, the size of the implant, it was off the shelf. There were only 12 sizes, it never fitted completely. It was difficult to measure exactly the position uh, interoperatively. Size of the screws is quite bulky. Um, and there was no implant available for the lateral Taylor dome. Now we are, um, I'm involved with um, uh, the AP sealer um, um, and it is tailor made for the patient. So there is an osteotomy guide which is based on the patient's anatomy. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the AP sealer is based on the uh, CT scan of the patient and also the implant or the, the uh, instrument, the guiding instrument is, um, is patient specific and it is done based on the uh, uh, on the MRI. So here you see the guide for the uh, osteotomy. 
um, which makes it uh, relatively easy to do the osteotomy. I mean, it is pre-planned, the depth and the location of the, oste of the osteotomy. Um, and this is the guide. And you see, I use the Hintemann spreader, so there is a lot of space in order to place your um, uh, guiding instrument. Um, you can make no mistake, basically, um, of how to how to drill and finally place uh, the implant. And you will see that the implant fits nicely. This is on a cadaver. Um, normally, of course, it's a metal implant, but you see that it fits nicely. And we're currently doing a prospective uh, a study. Um, so to conclude, pain comes from the bone, treat the bone. Remember the concept of edge loading. And I didn't talk about it, but check alignment. Orthopedics is alignment. Uh, so always check alignment, especially in secondary cases. See if there is a varus or valgus which you have to uh, uh, correct. And that finishes my presentation. Any questions? Good presentation, sir. New things to learn. Uh, Dr. Sampa, sir, do you want to ask anything? Yeah. Uh, sir, I just want to uh, ask you about uh, one centimeter defect on the shoulder of uh, the tailor's tailor dome, particularly on uh, the medial side. Uh, you still go for subchondral drilling and uh, BMD? Yes, for sure. Uh, I know uh, about uh, the, the research that has been published that shoulder lesions do worse than uh, uh, lesions that are not on the shoulder. That is absolutely not my uh, finding. Okay. I I don't believe that uh, all the lesions are on the shoulder. I I don't. I hardly know lesions that are not on the shoulder on the medial side. They're all on the shoulder, and they all do this. They have this ninety or eighty-eight percent protection result. So the um, the publications on um, that shoulder lesions do not as well as lesions that are not shoulder lesions. I don't recognize that at all. So I go even for uh, lesions up till 15 millimeter, I will consider uh, doing um, a bone marrow stimulation only. Great, thank you. Dr. Sonar, can I ask some question? Yes, sir, yes. Uh, Professor, you said uh, that uh, because of excessive loading, there is this uh, damage to the talus on the shoulder. Is that correct? You mean the edge loading? Um, no, if we see the um, uh, damage to the shoulder of the talus. That is, uh, the pathology is because of excessive loading. Pathomechanics. Not necessarily, no. Um, I mean, if you have the, the old osteochondritis dissecans, um, mm -hmm. so the non-traumatic lesion, they're always on the shoulder, isn't it? Um, but even the traumatic lesions, they are on the shoulder because after a supination trauma, the tail is tilts and the uh, shoulder tilts into the, um, uh, it, it, it butts uh, onto the distal tibia and, and makes it damage. So there is, uh, all it, the damage is always on the shoulder, always, but I mean, in, in uh, I don't know, I, it's it's always on the shoulder. I mean, there are lesions that are in the middle of the talus, but yes. that's very seldom, isn't it? Yes. Um, in your clinical practice, have you found out that this is present in a particular set of patients or particular sport is prone for this kind of patients that you see? No, no. It is uh, uh, mainly after supination trauma. Uh, those osteochondral defects on the medial side, also on the lateral side, they become... Uh, they become symptomatic. Maybe they were uh, like osteochondritis dissecans, and then they, they become symptomatic uh, after after a trauma. Uh, and on the lateral side, it's almost always uh, trauma, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's supination trauma. Sometimes it's after fracture, but the ones after a fracture, they're usually more widespread, there's usually more cartilage damage, they're not as easy to, to treat. I, I think osteochondral defect after a fracture are a different brand. It is more part of osteoarthritis. Uh, okay. Welcome, Thank you. welcome Mark. Uh, do you have any uh, 
opinion on these uh, osteochondral lesions of the terrace? Uh, well, I, I certainly uh, agree that the findings on MRI with uh, bone edema is very highly correlated with pain. I think we see some patients with uh, lesions with asym asymptomatic and they don't necessarily need treatment and the natural history is somewhat variable. Um, I'd be interested in uh, Dr. Nick's, uh, Professor Nick's idea, uh, thoughts on uh, hydrogels because uh, uh, that's uh, quite popular in Australia where I'm from. We don't so much use the uh, oats or uh, metal implants, but we do use um, uh, the one that uh, is popular here is uh, one called Joint Rep, which is a bioadhesive hydrogel. And I find that uh, obtaining a, a good seal above the, um, the lesion uh, can uh, provide, uh, pre prevent uh, cysts forming later. So I was wondering if, if, you, if you had any experience with that. No, thank you for the question. And uh, I think anything that I have no uh, no experience with that, but anything that can uh, seal off the, the and, and take care of the bone uh, bone lesion and, and seal it off, I think is uh, is good. So uh, I would be interested to uh, to see those uh, those results. But it sounds like a, something which is uh, interesting and could do the the job. Yeah, I think we we had. Um... Like there were some little patches, like chondro guide, but I don't think that they provided the seal that uh, you know we were looking for. But I think with um, them, as time passes, maybe some uh, gel sealing may be a, a, a good option. In the same way that a dentist would seal a filling, you know. But I think it comes down to the the type of uh, product that we use. Um, and uh, there, you know, as you say, we need to see the data a little bit more on that. Yeah, I think it's important that, uh, I mean, the, the cartilage is flexible. So the, the filling of the defect should have either the same flexibility and be at the mm. same height, or it should be a little bit um, below the surface, like a metal implant. I mean, it doesn't give in. So if you place a metal implant, then you have to go, obviously, if this is the surface, you have to go, um, uh, below it because the cartilage will compress. Um, so I think with any implants, it is sealing off the bony defect. And the other thing is taking off the load of the edges of the defect uh, and, yeah. and prevent crumbling down of the, of the intact uh, high, hyaline cartilage. Um, and um, well, any filling like this, uh, uh, Fibro cartilage will yeah, a, a, a larger defect is, is much harder to yeah. seal off and uh, the, the, the mechanical effects are, are in the joint are certainly much more profound, aren't they? Yes. But I also agree that uh, with access to the lesion, I like to do plan deflection of the ankle rather than uh, apply traction for most of the Taylor lesions and also go in posteriorly for posterior lesions. For tibial lesions, I think you need uh, distraction for many, yeah. They're not very yeah, I, common. I agree, but as, except for the posterior uh, plafond lesions because they are excellently I mean, it's more easy because the, of the, the shape of the joint. Um, you can get access to the posterior plafond uh, quite yeah. easily with uh, soft tissue distraction. Uh, but in the anterior part, it's more difficult. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Nick. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Uh, one last question, sir. Uh, how do you manage a patient with a pain and the talar osteochondral defect on the MRI, but no bone marrow edema? Is a question from Dr. Navid, arthroscopy surgeon from Nagpur. Well, you have a patient and he comes with, uh, let's say, anterolateral uh, pain, uh, sort of deep ankle pain, and then you, um, uh, you do your physical examination and uh, everything looks fine. And 
then you think, well, maybe he has an osteogonal defect, you may do the CT, and nothing is there, no bone marrow edema. Then you have to go back, because your expectation was on an MRI or on your CT or whatever, your expectation was, it was your working hypothesis, and now the working hypothesis is not met, okay? Then you have to go back to the patient and go to your uh, history taking again and your physical examination. And then when you do your physical examination, for example, the pain is more in the synostarsy. And then, um, so then your diagnosis is synostarsy uh, syndrome and not this osteochondral defect. So if you have an unexpected finding on your MRI, then um, always go back uh, to examine the patient and go for a new working hypothesis. And if then in your new working hypothesis, it's still osteogonal defect because there's nothing else. Um, and there is on the uh, MRI, this osteogonal defect, but there is hardly um, bone marrow edema. Then maybe the MRI is wrong. Um, so maybe the sequences were not right. So maybe you have to make a new MRI uh, or maybe you make a spec CT. I mean, you then want to prove really that this osteogonal defect is the, is causing your problem. So make a bone scan or do a, but you want to have some proof probably in that case. And sometimes you have a patient with a medial osteochondral defect and lateral pain. I think it's in 5% there is this crossover effect. Um, but then you want to make sure that there is bone marrow edema because then it yeah. is a little bit awkward. You have a medial osteochondral defect on your MRI and, <laughs> and you have lateral pain. Then you want to make sure that this osteochondral defect is the cause, and then you want mm -hmm. to see this bone marrow edema or a positive spec CT or bone scan. It is a difficult condition situation because the the patient and the radiologist will talk about the osteochondral lesion, but your clinical examination and history point to perhaps to some other diagnosis. So, so yeah, you have to be sure that uh, you have the diagnosis correct before you treat in that situation. Sometimes it's a bit of um, instability that can be causing the pain or synostasi. That seems to be the most common uh, misdiagnosis, I think. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Thank you, oh, Professor Nick, for a very, very enlightening three talks. And uh, these are relatively rare topics in foot and ankle to cover, and you have nicely covered. Uh, very informative. Thank you, sir. And may I now move to Dr. Satish Swarar, sir, President, uh, Arthroscopy Society, Nagpur, for uh, his talk on the arthroblastoma. Thank you, Dr. Satish Swarar, sir. Yes, can, yes you see my, can you see my screen? No, sir. You need to share the screen. Now you can see? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, ankle, <clears throat> ankle sprain is one of the most uh, common injury we get to see day to day in our uh, uh, outpatient department. And if it is not treated properly, it can lead to the chronic uh, instability episodes and uh, uh, impingement and pain. So the most commonly injured ligament in uh, anterolateral instability is anterior talofibular ligament. And if the instability episode goes on continue and there can be a chances of damaging the calcanofibular ligament also. So what is the specific test to diagnose the injury to the anterior talofibular ligament? And it's an anterior drawer test where with one hand you just you hold the lower end of the tibia and uh, with another hand holding the midfoot, you do an anterior drawer test just like a anterior cruciate ligament. And uh, you can feel uh, a give way or a soft uh, end point. And most of the time you can uh, see the dimpling in the uh, anterolateral uh, gutter. And that indicates the positive uh, anterior drawer test. 
and that uh, dimpling can be called as a suction sign. And second uh, important test to diagnose the anterior lateral instability is an inversion test. And it, it actually recreates the injury uh, mechanism, uh, which usually happen by twisting the ankle or a sudden fall of the foot in the ditch and the ankle goes into the plantar flexion and inversion. And if the trauma goes on continuing and there is a chances of uh, complete tear of the calcanofibular ligament uh, after the uh, anterior talofibular ligament. And here you can, the patient can feel the pain uh, and there can be a lateral opening. Uh, Taller test, Taller teal test uh, usually perform and it can diagnose injuries to both anterior talofibular as well as calcanofibular ligament. And if it is performed in the neutral uh, flexion and uh, inversion, that will test the calcanofibular ligament. And if it is done in a plantar flexion position with inversion, and that will test the ATFL. So you have to in all in all the these tests, you always have to compare with the normal side to see the uh, opening and the teller tilt. The imaging X-rays are usually less conclusive. They can either uh, show you the concomitant uh, cartilage uh, injuries or. Uh, 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 any avulsion type of injuries. MRI is the gold standard in diagnosing the ligament injuries. And here you can clearly see the thinned out and torn uh, anterior talofibular ligament. And because of the chronic nature of the injury, you can see there is a defect uh, uh, in the talar neck along, along with uh, there's a osteophytes at the uh, tibial plafond. So, if the patient is not uh, recovering with the physiotherapy, rehab, and conservative management, you can go for the brostrum repair. You can do it either uh, open or arthroscopically. So my talk is on arthroscopic uh, arthrobrostrum, so I will skip this uh, open technique. Uh, ankle arthroscopy can be done while using a traction, but I usually prefer uh, not using a traction and just uh, a gravity assisted technique uh, uh, with the foot on the edge of the table and uh, a, a pad or a bump just uh, uh, below the tendon Achilles. And I manage the inversion and eversion with uh, the assistant or myself while performing the arthroscopy. So the portals for the anterior arthroscopy, there are three, there are actually the two most commonly used portal. One is the anterolateral portal, which is just lateral to the peroneus tertius tendon uh, in a soft spot uh, along the joint line. Then the anteromedial portal is just medial to the tibialis anterior tendon, in the, uh, again in the soft spot. And the recently described uh, portal is the anterocentral portal. Uh, just like uh, uh, in a knee, we use the anterocentral portal through the patella tendon here we use uh, we make that portal just lateral to the neurovascular bundle uh, through the uh, extensor uh, tendon uh, while making the portal you have to always make in a mind that on the lateral side there is an intermediate branch of the sural nerve and if you go more laterally the uh, anterolateral branch of a common peroneal nerve superficial peroneal nerve. And if you go more laterally, there is a chances of uh, damaging the sural nerve. So you should not go too much uh, laterally. You should be uh, close to the peroneus tertius tendon on the lateral side in the soft spot. Uh, I always uh, inject a saline uh, through the portal about 10 cc and then make a portal. Uh, while doing the arthrobrustum, I mark the extensor or the peroneal retinoculum uh, the peroneus tendon and the superficial branch of the uh, super, uh, peron uh, intermediate branch of the superficial peroneal nerve so that uh, while making the portal I should not uh, injure it. So this is uh, go on to the medial port, anteromedial portal leaning the 
soft tissues. Here you can see because of the chronic nature of the injury, there's a impingement and the big bump along the talar neck. This is the lax uh, anterior talofibular ligament. Here you can see the ligament. And there is a big bump along the tibial plafond, which I have removed. This is a torn and lax ligament. I'm passing the anchor about one centimeter proximal to the tip of the fibula. Then using a micro lasso, micro suture lasso, passing the nitinol wire and then shuttle the fiber wires from the anchors to the ten, uh, ligament. Repeat the step again. This is the second anchor, just uh, one centimeter distally at the tip of the fibula. This is a single loaded anchor. Then re repeat the same step again. And this is after a complete repair. You can see the thick and taut anterior talofibular ligament. This is the repaired ATFL. So while uh, tying the suture knot, you have to keep the ankle in full dorsiflexion and uh, uh, eversion. This is the most critical step. These are the small portals with to which it has been repaired. You can see the anchors, one proximally and one at the tip of the uh, fibula. So postoperatively for the first three weeks, patient has to be in the uh, ankle brace, in, uh, immobilized for three weeks, non-weight bearing. From three to eight, eight weeks, start gradual mobilization, partial weight bearing, and gradually increase the flexibility and strength. From eight weeks to three months, patient can start weight bearing in a sport shoes, uh, full weight bearing. Increase range of movement, start strengthening exercises using therabands and proprioceptive exercises. So after four to eight months, patient can increase the strengthening exercises, start uh, uh, sport specific uh, training and cardiovascular uh, endurance. So this is the complete follow up of the patient and all the portals are healed. He has excellent strength. The inversion test and drawer tests are negative. He can do all the activities, squatting, square leg sitting. And here, the postoperative MRI, you can see the well healed talar defect and round uh, TBL plafond. And this is the two anchors with a healed ATFL. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Sati, sir. Uh, good presentation. Uh, sir, few quick questions. Uh, how uh, difficult is to move the inferior extensor retinaculum uh, while doing the ATFL repair arthroscopically? Uh, when after passing the sutures through the uh, and ATFL, then I just make a small nick uh, about a centimeter just uh, uh, on the extensor retinaculum and retrieve those fibers through the extensor retinaculum and then tie it. So it will be just like a, a double breasting or a modified uh, uh, brostrum procedure. Right. Sir, any uh, tip to avoid the uh, superficial peroneal nerve injury or any incidents where you get the injury of uh, or the hypoesthesia of the dorsum of the foot after arthrobrostrum? So, the portal has to be quite close to the uh, peroneus tertius on the lateral side. If you go too much uh, lateral, there, there are chances of uh, injuring the uh, intermediate branch of the uh, uh, superficial peroneal nerve. The sural nerve is far lateral uh, near the uh, peroneal tendon, so it's uh, less likely to be uh, get injured. Dr. Mark, we would yeah, like... Yes, sir. sir. Sampath, sir, please. Yeah. Uh, just uh, to avoid the injury, um, basically, we teach beginners to plantar flex the foot first, hold the fourth metatarsal as a key and plantar flex it. 
and so many times you will be able to palpate it just before you start just before you inflate you can mark it because on plantar flexion of foot particularly the fourth metatarsal if you palpate around the ankle you will feel that uh, uh, branch of the superficial peroneal nerve that is one second uh, when you take the uh, anteromedial portal and illuminate that lateral part so many times there also you can uh, you can try to see this so there are the few tips where you can avoid and third is when you take uh, the incision it is just on the skin and always dilate it with the mosquito so few tips to avoid it yes true right. true absolutely right dr mark your techniques arthrobrostum versus mini open atfl repair well um look i, I was trained with uh, the basic brostrum uh, and i have uh, kind of stuck with that so it's a mini open technique combined with arthroscopy for all, all my cases and um but i do believe that the future is of for the arthrobrostrum um I think uh, any time we can use endoscopic techniques, it's uh, it, it's a great way to go. And there are some wonderful uh, you know, papers now talking about the results of arthrobrostrum. Uh, but I personally, uh, I have generally done um, uh, just a mini open uh, technique, which uh, I found still found to be very effective. Yes, Rajkumar, sir. Uh, Professor, I agree with you that, uh, yes, a mini open still has got a role uh, to play uh, in uh, Boston procedures. I just want to uh, add to the discussion. Most often when you see these uh, chronic ankle ligament injuries where you see that uh, the ATFL is uh, weak or stretched and uh, the calcaneal fibular ligament is also involved. There is an incidence that sometimes you will find a loose body into the lateral gutter. So, uh, the origin of this loose body is from the talus, from the tibial plafond, or from the articular surface of the fibula. Uh, any thoughts on that? And anybody has found out from where this actually comes? We find that there is a loose body there existing, but where the loose body has come from, where it has actually... Uh, uh, come out from we don't know what is the formation of that any thoughts professor yeah dr mark please uh, uh sometimes you see uh, and it's very painful for the patient uh the the loose fragment on the x-ray which is often located just at the anterior edge of the tip of the fibula is that the one that you are talking about because i that that i think is almost a bony avulsion from some of the ATFL. So I would, uh, I generally excise that bone and, uh, and reattach the ATFL in that location. Uh, and that, yeah, that is, a, that is a, something that we see, yeah, definitely. Yeah, can I, can I uh, say something about it? Oh, sir, please. So actually, um, uh, I also do uh, open brostrum, but I do arthroscopy just to see few things that uh, Pre-operative evaluation with MRI is very important. See, when uh, it is chronic instability, particularly ATFL, then always you should see some uh, medial dome lesions, OCD. And um, I, if uh, you uh, see it properly, what is the um, pain, uh, origin of pain? Uh, apart from instability, you may have to treat OCD lesion as well. And if you are not sure, then scope it, see the medial uh, dome or see the uh, palpate with your um, uh, probe, uh, the cartilage. Um, loose bodies, I'm not, uh, I have not seen much, but definitely try to look in cases of instability about the cartilage condition. Scope it. It is like orthoscopy people, they do it for HTO. They will have a quick look uh, with the scopy about the uh, cartilage condition and they will do the HTO. Similarly, you do brostrum. Uh, before that, even if you are doing open, that's fine. Just do the scope because with scope, you will see the cartilage condition nicely and then uh, go ahead with the way uh, you proceed either open or on the scope. True. I, think, I think that is the advantage of arthrobrustum that uh, you can treat the concomitant injuries also. So uh, many mm -hmm. times there is an impingement, you can do the osteoplasty. 
and there are taller or sometimes even the tibial fluff and cartilage defect that you can manage uh, while doing the orthobrustum. So I think uh, the orthobrustum can mm, help in fine, uh, diagnosing the concomitant and treating those injuries also. So, this, sir, can I ask one question, please? Yes, sir. Uh, are you adding some uh, fiber wire or internal breeze along with this uh, for augmentation uh, for CFL? Uh, have you done uh, uh, that along with it? No, one, only once I did a CFL, that time I uh, put a third anchor quite... Uh, I use an accessory anterolateral portal and uh, put a third anchor posterior, uh, more posterior laterally and then took a bite through the CFL. Right. Can I ask a question? I think if I was training now, I would do astrobrostrum. <laughs> okay. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, sir, please. Uh, which is the position of the ankle that you would want to tighten your uh, sutures across the uh, repair? Is it neutral? Uh, yes. is it in, uh, Just I mentioned the full dorsiflexion and eversion. Full dorsiflexion and eversion. Professor, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Professor Mark? I'm um, sorry, yes. No, I, I agree. I think always when I tighten, even in the mini open, I always like to have the foot in dorsiflexion and eversion to get a nice tight repair. Because I don't think you can over tighten. I don't see that. Maybe if you're doing maybe a internal brace where you don't get the flexibility, maybe you could over tighten. But I don't think if you're just using the patient's own ligaments that you can over tighten. Yes. Have you found that in uh, tightening in that position, uh, does it cause any uh, limitation of movement or the patients come back to you saying that I just find a tweak of pain uh, when I do certain kind of movements in the ankle? Have they come back to me saying that not, I, they are not comfortable? Uh, I haven't found that myself. Um, they do, all patients will have a, a temporary uh, uh, loss of movement and, um, and some discomfort attached to that. Uh, but I find that that sort of peaks around five or six weeks and then, and then fades away quite rapidly. There are a small group of patients where they might make hypertrophic scar tissue and they can be, uh, they, they, they need a sort of a different program, I think, where, where they you know, may need to have uh, some injections or in ca some cases another arthroscopy to remove the scar tissue. That's a small group, but um, I find the biggest uh, problem in, in, for me it has been uh, the patients uh, are too aggressive with their, their rehabilitation and they, that promotes a lot of uh, pain and scar tissue. So so I tend to avoid physiotherapy for at least about four or five weeks to let the, let the tissues and the body heal itself. Uh, Mark, any experience on uh, uh, reconstruction of the anterolateral ligament and when you will uh, recommend it? Uh, I think if patients have symptomatic instability and they've failed conservative treatment, and they like to, and they feel uh, that it is impeding their life, then they're a definite candidate for reconstruction because it's a totally different operation than a knee reconstruction, which has a you know a twelve month recovery. But an ankle reconstruction is a very satisfying procedure and very very good results. So, so no, I mean uh, the patient reconstruction using or uh, augment. Oh, using augmentation, yes, yes. like an internal brace or something. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. Now I find that a good good procedure, uh, but I tend to reserve it for um, for more uh, revision cases or severe cases, or cases where there are um, other biomechanical issues. Like uh, actually, I'm doing one 
tomorrow where a patient has a lot of cava virus. Okay. So are we going to do a calcaneal osteotomy and also use internal brace reconstruction? Because I find that those patients uh, where there is some tendency to virus, uh, the, if you do a standard reconstruction, it can uh, fail over time. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Satish, sir, for the enlightening presentation. Uh, may I now request Dr. Sampath, sir, for his talk on the management of the syndesmotic injury. Dr. Sampath, please. Uh, are you able to see my screen, sir? Yes, sir. And am I audible correctly? Yes, sir. So I'm going to talk about management of syndesmotic injuries. Uh, through cases, we'll see how do we evaluate injury. Now, she is a lady doctor who presented to us with uh, fall uh, while playing. And um, uh, let us see how do we evaluate the injury because uh, this was uh, an innocent x-ray. Uh, he was put in slab, but um, definitely she, her pain was beyond what her x-ray was showing. So uh, let us see how do we evaluate uh, have a closer look at the uh, ankle. It was little widened medially. MRI was done and uh, see the anterior inferior tibia fibular ligament is injured. Posterior inferior tibia fibular ligament is injured. Even uh, deep deltoid was gone. So it is more than what we uh, see uh, on X-ray. And uh, CT cuts were done to see the posterior malleus fracture. And see most important is this syndesmosis is definitely not congruent. So this is beyond what we see on those X-rays. And uh, along with all these investigations, even these stress views were very helpful in this case. So innocent looking X-ray turned out to be like this uh, severe unstable uh, syndesmotic injury, high fibula fracture, and look at the uh, instability on stress view, the uh, uh, gravity stress view as, as well as dorsiflexion, external rotation stress view was done. So do evaluate the injury preoperatively and uh, it will yield some information. Another case, again, it's a type C fracture, supracindesmotic fibula fracture, median narrowness fracture. Again, you have to suspect the injury. To evaluate the injury, you should suspect the injury. Again, looks a little innocent, but uh, look at the mechanism of injury. If it is a rotational injury, look for the clinical features and do suspect the injury. If you don't evaluate preoperatively with whatever investigations you have, then intraoperatively you have these issues. Suddenly you see that, oh, syndesmosis is uh, absolutely unstable. After anesthesia, under CM, this is the picture. And then you, uh, we ended up in um, reducing the syndesmosis, reduce the fibula fracture and fixing it with syndesmotic screws. So, First is evaluation. For evaluation, you have to suspect it. For that, see the mechanism of injury, examine, do some preoperative investigation, and again, stress view is very important. This is how, this is how we ended up in uh, fix a, uh, fixing this fracture. Another case, another case where uh, it's a uh, fibula fracture. Uh, Again, uh, looks innocent. Um, my colleague asked me whether, and one uh, tip of the fifth metatarsal fracture, whether we can conserve, but again, patient had significant pain, pain, and pain was beyond mm, this particular uh, X-ray. So, uh, okay, this video is not playing. Uh, again, MRI is done and see the posterior inferior tibia fibular ligament is intact, but anterior tibia fibular ligament is gone and also the deep deltoid was gone in this particular case. And uh, let me, okay, uh, and okay, I have not mounted that particular slide. It was so unstable in drop, it, the uh, syndesmotic, uh, this thing was completely open. We ended up in uh, fixing the fibula and uh, two syndesmotic screws. Now you have to uh, uh, suspect it, you have to, um, uh, document the instability and then you have to fix it. But when you are fixing it, reduction is also important. 
reduction of the syndesmosis is important. So how do we uh, assess the reduction? So many times when you are fixing the fibula, the tibial lip is in front of you, you can see the reduction. And we have in this case uh, done the CT scan for our study, post-op CT scan, see it is sitting up nicely because even um, mal reduction of syndesmosis is also uh, common. It is not that uncommon. So uh, assess the instability, reduce it properly, and then fix it. Fix it either with screw or uh, uh, the flexible uh, technique. Here we did not uh, do the repair of delta because it was sitting up quite nicely. This is post-op CT showing the good reduction of syndesmosis as well as the medial clear space. Uh, we know that this incidence of syndesmosis has, has is been changing now because we are uh, diagnosing uh, uh, more in detail. And uh, uh, we know about the anatomy, most important ligaments, uh, the anterior and posterior tibiofibular ligaments inferior, and out of which posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament contributes the most. Few radiological parameters to diagnose or to know the uh, instability. Uh, we know the tibiofibular overlap and the medial clear space. Uh, tibiofibular overlap um, probably is position dependent. So medial clear space is more uh, looked for. Uh, this is how these radiological parameters all, also may deceive you uh, because of the overlap is different in different rotations. Um, sometimes you have to do stress views before, like this is a Weber B, uh, do the gravity stress view, it will show you the uh, syndesmosis instability. Entrop, you can test this stability, few papers mentioning whether you should see it in coronal plane or sagittal plane, but do suspect it and intraoperative after fixation of every ankle fracture, do not forget to um, test for the instability, either coronal or sagittal. But whatever papers they are talking about, they were cadaveric uh, papers where they talked about uh, the instability in uh, both planes. Um, now, assessment of reduction. We talked about how do we assess instability, reduction. How do we see reduction? Apart from radiology, here is uh, we have uh, exposed the fibula. Now this is the lip of tibia, anterior lip of tibia. You see how, where the fibula is sitting nicely or not. You can even palpate it with your mosquito. If you have not opened it that much, then your mosquito or your artery forcep can uh, be your finger and you can palpate whether this fibula is sitting up nicely in the tibial lip. And then you have to uh, fix it. So assessment of reduction is also important. And then few points that syndesmotic screws, you know that it has to be uh, 30 degree uh, anterior, but if you are not that particular, then hold on the reduction with one K wire, which will act as derotation. So when you are introducing your screw, it should not change your direction of a fibula and it will not change your reduction. One or two screws, still the debit is on, three or four cortices, same thing, but um, definitely foot in neutral position may not be hyperdorsiflexion. Suture button fixation, yes, it is uh, also that uh, it is stable as compared to the screw. It is also a device. And um, uh, now the uh, screw fixation, if you talk about screw fixation, then mal reduction is common. Here in my case, this was a fixation done with fibula and a screw. Now I used partially threaded screw. Now this partially threaded screw caused um, over reduction. That means it was very tight in the um, uh, syndesmotic and patient had severe pain. I had to remove the screw after three months and then patient got the pain, uh, pain, uh, relief in pain. See, this is my post-op CT. I had over compressed it. So better to use the fully threaded screw as a syndesmotic screw if you are using it. So um, a good reduction and a positional screw uh, will work for the uh, see now I removed the screw and then his patient his pain went away. Mal reduction is also common uh, if you do 
post-operative CT scan, uh, it is seen. And some papers, they uh, uh, note that if you, your patient is unhappy, if it is mal deduced, and then you remove the syndesmotic screw, there are chances that it may relocate. I will end up with a last case where it was six weeks old fracture, a fibula with a medial gap uh, that is widening of the medial clear space. It was un unstable syndesmosis. Uh, we released the fibula and uh, here uh, we achieved the length. We used suture uh, device for flexible fixation. Uh, he is a farmer patient. And uh, here we use this suture button um, and see the uh, result after a year. He's, now we have almost more than three years follow. He's absolutely doing well. He's doing all his uh, activities of daily living and absolutely stable syndesmosis. Only suture button was used here. Orthoscopic also, uh, or if it is only a ligament injury uh, without fractures, you can assess it orthoscopic as well and use suture button or screw for uh, fixation of the syndesmosis. So uh, you should suspect the injury. You should document the instability and reduce the fibula anatomically. And then you can uh, uh, fix it either with the screw or the flexible fixation modalities available. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, do we have any questions? Uh, Sampath, sir, do you found uh, any difference between uh, using a screw or a flexible device like a button uh, while treating syndesmotic injury? Actually, uh, personally, I was under the impression that uh, the screw is uh, definitely a stronger fixation. Uh, but here in this case, I'm very well convinced he's a farmer and I used only the single uh, suture button and it is working absolutely fine, absolutely fine. But still, personally, uh, whenever there is, there is more unstable situation like high fibula fracture, I will use screw. Okay. When I have, I'm fixing the fibula, uh, then I'll be comfortable in using the suture button. But uh, if it is high fibula fracture and we are not addressing it, probably that may be my personal opinion, but I'm using screw. Uh, in that context. Yeah. Sampas, sir, in one of your case, uh, you have applied a plate of the posterior lateral or, or the lateral surface, anatomical plate, and you have passed a syndesmotic screw outside the plate. So any preference or like this is your routine thing? Actually, uh, that was the only time when I have applied that anatomical plate, which was on lateral side. But uh, I, I prefer under countered plate for fibula on posterolateral border. So... <laughs> Under countered plate, I prefer uh, one third tubular plate on postulateral border. So, if you want to put a screw, syndesmotic screw through the anatomical plate, so what will be your direction of drill? Is uh, the same 20 to 25 degree anterior? Uh, again, it will be same, but then uh, I will hold that particular position which I have achieved with one D, uh, K wire so that okay. whatever I am putting it uh, and that will not change my direction of the fibula reduction. So then it will be positional screw. I will be putting one K wire above the screw or below the screw first. All right. And sir, you said in one of your uh, uh, study uh, literature, you said uh, if you take out the screw, even it, if, if it is mal reduced, it, the syndesmotic space, again, it gets reduced. So what is the time limit uh, like during which you can get a spontaneous correction of your syndesmosis malignant? So that is a American army uh, based paper and the, it talked about uh, time duration about three months. They have reduced, they did CT scan uh, in all those post-operative patients and they found out that if uh, it was mal reduced and they removed the screw, then almost more than 80% uh, this thing, they, they could found, uh, find out uh, the relocation to some extent. I mean, 80% is a huge amount. Uh, for correction. So, would you uh, would you advise to take out the syndesmotic screw within three months if it is looking mal reduced on uh, post operative exit? Yeah, definitely a good idea because, as in my case, I showed you that I used partially threaded screw, 
patient was not happy because it i over tightened the syndesmotic area so once i removed it his pain went away so if patient is not getting complete dorsiflexion or you notice that it is mal reduced definitely it is worth to remove the screw dr mark do you have a same technique of putting a syndesmotic screw or you treat it little different oh i think for the traumatic cases that you described is very similar you uh reduce and put a screw and uh and uh by and large we tend to take the screw out uh i would tend to take the screw out after about uh 8 to 10 weeks but um uh, i know in uh, the us it's uh most of the time they let the frac the screw break so it's uh it's more of a personal thing the most uh, experience that i have with syndesmotic injuries is with uh these days more with a professional athlete where they have a syndesmosis injury without fracture so uh they particularly in australian football it's a common injury they they have a forced compression eversion injury and so they they uh they that treatment has evolved initially when i first started practice years ago it was conservatively treated and the patient would return to play about 8 or 9 weeks but now with uh, pressure for patient players to return earlier uh you know they have scan the mri scanning and now initially we started doing arthroscopy and i must say there's a very good tool to look at the stability of the syndesmosis so you learn a lot from that Definitely. and uh Yeah. and uh, so that that's very useful and so we could assess the stability of the syndesmosis and uh, treat as necessary initially we used a screw but over the last few years we've gone to just uh using tight rope anchor flexible and uh so yeah so that's uh that's quite quite good and um and now now we've done so many that we don't even bother with the arthroscope we just put the anchor in uh based on the mri finding so um so it's not uh it, it's more a specific group but i would say it's very it's a very good tool arthroscopy if you want to decide if you if you have a if you have a significant instability and b if you have reduced it and stabilized it and you want to check that you have uh, achieved good reduction and and stability after after so that that's not too bad to use but it doesn't have to be done all the time yes i'm positive yeah uh, can i ask um, uh, professor mark um initially when you were conserving those ligament injuries pure ligament injuries what was the outcome i mean do you find any need for aggressive treatment of these pure ligament syndesmotic injuries um only in the professional uh athletic situation when uh so the two things that um i guess the professional athlete is looking for in a in a team situation is the the they want uh obviously to get back and play uh, earlier but also to have certainty around their recovery so uh for a lot of reasons they like to know that it's fixed and that they can they can rehab with confidence uh and uh, and and then you know it it also saves the issue of the occasional athlete that might you know might take 3 months rather than 2 months to get back and and there's a lot of awkward conversations that happen uh between uh coaches and team doctors in those situations so so definitely you know because i'm in melbourne and there's like 10 afl fo- professional football teams so so there's a lot of um there's a, a you know injuries like that are, are not uncommon and also they and so the evolution has been more for intervention uh whereas as i said many you know 15 years ago there would not have been but it's the same in uh, i've talked in talk spoke probably 
Professor Van Dyke would be good to talk to as well about this. But I know in uh, English Premier League and things, if they do uh, syndesmosis, they get two two syn two type of bankers, and away they go, and uh, and that's the way it is for us. So we tend to. Um, put them in a boot for one or two weeks and then they can go back to doing things as they wish. Thank sometimes you. play four weeks, sometimes six or eight. Mm. Uh, yeah, of um, course, yeah, last question. In experience of Dr. Patil as well as Dr. Mark, uh, have they found any difference between putting the screw and putting the sutures across the syndesmosis? Uh, were there, uh, we know the screws can fail. Uh, were there failures in the sutures that go across the syndesmosis? Any experience with that? Okay, I will answer that first. I have not used uh, many suture buttons, except few because of cost as a limitation. Um, but uh, screw also, uh, if you inform the patient prior that even if it breaks, uh, it's fine. It is going to auto stabilize. I, we have not found many of these things except few where you have not reduced it properly. Then it is not a uh, issue of screw. It is an issue of mal reduction itself. So mainly important is mal reduction. Uh, fixation modality may uh, differ. Of course, uh, suture button is going to be flexible. It may uh, allow you to relocate. But the uh, issue with the screw is mal reduction. So do open way, see that, uh, see if this is fibula and uh, this is the tibia lip, see that it is sitting up nicely in anterior lip and posterior lip. Then your screw will not do a, uh, a bad job. So it is the reduction probably which matters more. Uh, I think I agree. I think, I, well, I agree with that definitely. I also think in the more severe cases, a uh, screw is definitely the way to go. I found that doing when we were doing the arthroscopically assisted, that the, the screw was much better at, at reducing the syndesmosis. Uh, and then once it was reduced, you could support it with a, an endo button if you wished. But um, I think for most of the fracture cases, a screw is probably the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Professor and Dr. Partley. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, may I now invite Dr. Mark, sir, for, uh, for his talk on the role of the endoscopy in the traumatic ankle conditions. Uh, okay. Well, let me share my screen. Uh, before you talk, may I invite Dr. Satish, sir, to have a brief introduction of Dr. Mark Vlakni. Uh, oh. Dr. Mark Vlakni works in, a, in Melbourne and he's a renowned uh, ankle foot surgeon in Australia. And uh, he works mainly in uh, Park Clinic and uh, St. Mercy Hospital. And uh, no problem. And uh, I have been involved with uh, Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association for the last five years and uh, chairman of the foot and ankle section for that time. So, uh, yeah, I've had a lot of involvement with uh, all Asia and a lot in India as well. So it's good. Been very enjoyable. <laughs> so you. let me share my screen. Yes. yes. Okay. How is that? Is that good? Absolutely, sir. Oh, good. All right. So, so this is a, uh, a talk that I've given uh, with uh, just a more of an expose on uh, various endoscopic treatments of trauma and just a little bit of a literature view to try to promote some discussion and uh, give some ideas of what's happening. So really, you know, we're talking about arthroscopy, endoscopy, and also now in foot and ankle, we have minimally invasive. So why is there all these things good? And, and reason being is because the foot and ankle has, as we all know, a very unique skin envelope. We want to minimize swelling, reduce wound problems and infection, cause less issues to nerves and vessels, and ultimately provide faster recovery. 
but uh, ultimately we have to know is it is it better so endoscopic treatments are, are far better when it comes to skin and nerves we don't seem to get any of these problems but for bones and joints it depends on uh, a number of factors so when we're talking about endoscopic treatments you have to identify the goal we have to decide whether the access and the visualization that we get is good and will the underlying results be better will we uh, respect the biomechanics of the foot and what are the risks and what will be the best for the patient so the first one i'm going to talk about is achilles tendon rupture uh, and uh, this is just uh, the technique uh, that we you, one of the Minimally invasive techniques is the, uh, using the Acalon uh, device, which provides percutaneous uh, suturing abilities. There is also an endoscopic percutaneous repair uh, available. And there is also obviously a non-operative technique too. So the results uh, do show good results with uh, the Acalon with uh, open and, uh, and the percutaneous style repair providing similar results with a smaller incision. This is uh, another biomechanical study looking at this device uh, versus uh, standard suturing and shows that the, in some ways the repair was stronger and tougher. Excuse me. <coughs> There is also an endoscopic assisted technique using a modified Bunnell suture with uh, percutaneous suturing, which uh, was quite an interesting technique. It's not something that's used in Australia, but uh, it is interesting to see. When we look at uh, calcaneal fractures, we now see that uh, this uh, has become uh, an area where endoscopic uh, techniques are now used with arthroscopic assistance, looking at the subtalar joint, allowing for uh, ease of reduction of the uh, articular fragment. Uh, although sometimes this can be technically demanding, but the risks of open surgery in calcaneal fracture are high, particularly with wound healing and infection. When we look at some results, uh, this is from 2014, 13 patients with arthroscopic reduction and percutaneous fixation. So they did find a very high level of success with uh, a very high uh, articular reduction congruity um, study and similar results to open. So the trend to arthroscopic assisted calcaneal fracture is uh, fixation is quite strong. If we look at say pilon fracture, which is also another intra-articular fracture. We do see some uh, reports uh, of arthroscopic assisted external and internal fixation. Uh, here is a study uh, looking uh, at this fracture with um, in 2015, showing a minimally invasive approach with arthroscopic guided reduction of uh, fracture segments, which uh, would be uh, quite useful. If we then move on to ankle fractures, there is also a uh, minimally invasive approach with uh, fibula nailing techniques. Uh, and this uh, has been shown to be useful. Uh, this is a study with, uh, from 2014 showing an arthroscopic evaluation, closed reduction and a percutaneous nailing. And I see that this would be quite useful in uh, diabetic patients or patients where there is uh, uh, some compromise to the skin around the fracture, which might provide an, an, another alternative to standard treatment. We've already talked about the syndesmosis and the, and, uh, the ability to, um, to diagnose and treat uh, arthroscopically. So the way uh, I assess the syndesmosis arthroscopically is that uh, you will need a, a, a a traction device. You don't need to have mechanical traction, but just an assistance to pull with the strap. And if you use your probe and you can put the probe in between the tibia and fibula and twist the probe, 
90 degrees and the fibula will move, uh, then you have instability. And also you, you can check in sagittal plane stability as well because normally the fibula has, has very little movement, but it's in as much structure, uh, you can get a lot of movement. So it's good for confirmation of diagnosis. As we discussed, we use the probe test and evaluation of reduction and fixation. So here's a couple of examples of uh, uh, the treatments. We've already talked about ankle osteochondral lesions, and uh, um, uh, I do prefer to do all of my osteochondral uh, defect treatments arthroscopic. I, it's, I virtually never uh, do open surgery for these, regardless of size, uh, but I, and I don't uh, do oats or metal implants uh, uh, this is a, a case early on where we where we did a where we used to use a, a Macy patch, uh, but uh, and we wrote up a study of this in American Journal of Sports Medicine ten years ago, which very good results. But uh, we no longer have access to this from a cost point of view. We already talked about uh, the traumatic uh, ostrogonum, so I won't talk about that. This is just uh, another image which I'm sure you've seen. The other um, uh, area is perineal tendoscopy. And uh, this is uh, something which uh, is useful. And uh, I think that um, there are some quite interesting studies on techniques. Looking at the perineals, there are three zones, proximal, distal, plantar areas quite easy to visualize once you're in, but it is quite difficult to do things. So I was very interested to see that uh, perineal stabilization procedures could be done endoscopically with a percutaneous tendon repair, retinacular repair, and an endoscopic fibular groove deepening. Uh, I've not done this, but um, uh, I think it would be quite technically challenging. We already talked about arthrobrostrum uh, with uh, Dr. Satish, and that was an excellent talk. And um, uh, when we look at uh, the results uh, and the technique is very similar to what was described. And uh, this was originally popularized, popularized by Acevedo, who started this very early on. And uh, this is a very good uh, series with excellent results uh, followed over, over two years with only one recurrent instability. So there is some benefits and some uh, popularization of this. So we have another study from Lee with 28 patients uh, with a very significant reduction in anterior draw. Uh, if we go further down the foot, we have uh, uh, the Jones fracture, which uh, is uh, also something which can be done virtually percutaneously uh, with a screw. And uh, I usually make a little secondary incision at the fracture site and use the bone graft from the drill and insert it into the fracture. So when we look at some data, uh, this is a, um, uh, a review from 2014 by Mark Glazebrook looking at evidence-based recommendations. He thought there was weak evidence for benefits with the flexor hallucis longus, Achilles and perineals. And most of the data with perineal tendoscopy is really just level four and level five studies. So there probably needs to be more research in that area. So what are the complications that you could achieve by trying to do endoscopic trauma treatment. Well, the first is that you have an inability to uh, achieve what you want to do. And sometimes with endoscopy and arthroscopy, you have to have a backup because you may not be able to achieve what you wanted to. So you need to consider that when you're trying to do the surgery. And sometimes arthroscopic procedures, while they may appear good, they do take much longer and sometimes they're a lot more expensive as well. And sometimes you need to be careful with uh, using your 
arthroscopic tools that you don't damage some of the peripheral nerves in and out. So you need to take care with the skin. So really in summary, uh, I think there are a number of exciting techniques and uh, the obvious, there are obvious advantages and uh, the, ultimately we'll all be driving to do things endoscopically. But we must uh, be able to fix the problem we're trying to treat and do it uh, in a way that is either equal to or better than open surgery. And that some of the treatments are still very in the, in the early stages of evaluation. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mohan. Uh, may I now invite Dr. Sampath, sir, to moderate the session. Yeah. Um, it was a great talk. Thank you, sir. Um, it is really interesting, uh, uh, minimally invasive uh, interventions, particularly in uh, fracture calcinium, as we are going more minimally invasive. Um, any, uh, any thoughts on calcinium and pilon? Because these two areas in trauma, they are uh, really good. Only issue is that in pilon, that extravasation of fluid when we use um, at, as a uh, arthroscopy as a, a reduction uh, visualization tool. So any thoughts on that, sir? Do you do dry arthroscopy or uh, you do it for only limited uh, time? Well, I, I'm not really treating pilon fracture these days, so I, I, I will have to talk theoretically. But um, I think uh, dry... I think, do you do, do, you do a, a stage? So you put an external fixature and come back later? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so you could argue to do an arthroscopy at the time, at the first, uh, when you put the X fix on to see if you can assess and manipulate the articular surface at least. And uh, so I, I, if, if, if the water, if the extravasation is a big issue, then dry, dry arthroscopy is probably the way to go. If you've got good distraction, you can see very well with the dry, dry arthroscope, but there's always a lot of bleeding. So it must, it would be very difficult. Uh, but uh, I think you'd have to, at some point, I think some point there is, must be some consideration for accurate reduction of the articular surface. In the very common unit ones, you won't be getting a good result. But but if you feel that you can, it, it would always help, I would think. Yeah. And um, uh, when we are talking about those minimally invasive for Achilles particularly, uh, again, uh, probably uh, we are talking about the non-insertional ruptures, which are really good Correct. for this. Yeah. Because then uh, if it is uh, insertional or some pathological tendon, probably these are, uh, they may not be reserved for those uh, things. So when there is another, there is a, there is a, a, a percutaneous technique which uses um, uh, anchors into the calcaneum as well. But most, uh, it's very uncommon for me to treat a, an insertional rupture, but uh, but most, you know, ninety-five percent of ruptures that I would treat are in uh, the mid-substance. But I think it's good. It's a good. Um, the percutaneous techniques is not my primary technique. My main technique is still a mini open, uh, where I can anatomically repair. But for patients, maybe some elderly patients or patients where I'm worried about the wound, like then I would definitely consider the percutaneous and I've always used the Acolon device, uh, which has been quite useful. Although there's another one from Arthrex, I think, which I used the last time. Yeah, and what, what, how do people treat the Achilles rupture in, in your area? So it is really interesting. That is why I brought out this point. Um, now we are getting more and more sports people, but uh, it is not that common to get those non insertional uh, tears in healthy tendon. Actually, okay. more, more common is insertional or degenerative ruptures. So that is what I was making. Yeah, that's a totally different disease, yeah. Dr. Rajkumar wanted to ask you something. Yeah. Yeah, um, moving uh, slightly away from the acute ruptures, uh, if we have to treat chronic ruptures of the tendon, are there any 
augmentation procedures that uh, are uh, available and that you people are doing so that we can uh, speed up the healing of the tendon my my go-to procedure has always been the flexahalysis flexahalysis longus tendon transfer. So that that uh, is is what I would use, and I would if I needed more length of the Achilles, I would maybe do a turn down or a or a VY lengthening. Uh, so that so I find that the FHL transfer provides excellent power for for the result and i put it uh, into the calcaneum with an anchor and then uh, suture the tendon onto the achilles after that and then uh, look at the achilles repair after i do the tendon transfer more so so yeah you do see it uh, and i have treated people up to 12 months rupture that way with good result so, Dr. Rajkumar, uh, uh, if we are treating chronic Achilles ruptures, do keep it in mind the uh, the associated comorbidities. Do uh, if he is symptomatic, because so many times chronic ruptures, if they have diabetic smokers and elderly, they may be treated conservatively as well. But as you uh, you say that it is a symptomatic conservative uh, chronic rupture then these are the augmentation techniques which uh, Dr. Mark has. Yeah, offered. I would say you have, you know, these things are very good, but the hardest thing about Achilles rupture is not the tendon, it's the wound. Yeah. So you uh, so you have to make sure that that can be healed. And the biggest discussion I have with the patient in those circumstances is not whether I can fix the tendon. It's more whether we can get things to heal and they can avoid uh plastic surgery or those sorts of things. And if you are treating it surgically, then there is a guide probably in roughly in terms of the defect because chronic Achilles rupture is uh, all about managing the defect after development of tendon, how much defect it remains. So if it is only one or two centimeters, as Dr. Mark said about the gastroxolis lengthening or turn down flap may help. But if it is beyond three centimeters, then you'll have to augment it, something which he talked about, FHL or even uh, free tendon autographs also will do. Yeah. You can either use, you can either harvest the flexohalysis longus at the ankle and put it into the, uh, put it into the um, calcaneum, or you can harvest it more distally if you need to use more tendon to use as a weave as well in your repair. So there are a couple of options. Is there any role of using uh, patches or any fibrin clot of a thing uh, to enhance healing at the uh, repair site? Any I patches? think those things are, uh, are, if you need it, definitely. But I, fortunately, I have not needed it. But I find that if I can, mob I tend to spend a lot of time mobilizing the proximal uh, End. And I can usually get something pretty close, but I, I think that, you know, you, you may, you know, I think I, you, you, you would definitely see some cases that have very severe uh, contractions and, and maybe, maybe they'd be better off with an ankle arthrodesis, some of them. The question is both to Dr. Patil as well as Dr. Mark. Uh, coming to the calcaneal fractures, if you might ask, Mm -hmm. um, your experience with uh, uh, nail versus a plate for calcaneal fractures? Um, so the, the, the nail is the, the one that I, if we use here is called the calcaneal. If you've, is that the one you're talking about? Yes, the one which uh, Mario Golzak, uh, Professor, the late mm. Mario Golzak uh, started. In yeah, I, I kind of really like that. Yeah, I use it for some subtalar arthrodesis yeah. as well, but I I haven't had the chance to use it for uh, the calcaneum fracture yet. But I think it's a really good device. If you may so, have wanted to share, uh, I I was with uh, Mario Golzak in the inception or the initial 
clinical research was being done on calcaneal in Toulouse. Uh -huh. So, he was so you very positive? He, he was very positive and forthright and wanted to do great things with it. But yes, uh, the Lord wanted him to come over. So, yes, he lost mm. to know about it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's a, a very innovative and a very, very uh, interesting device. I'd be very keen to see how it, uh, the, when, when some series comes out with it. But it has become quite um, popular in Australia for difficult subtalar arthrodesis, I would say. So if you have a revision case or uh, an old... Uh, uh, say someone who's had an ankle arthrodesis and you need a lot of stability uh, underneath the fusion, it's a good option. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, for the want of time, can we uh, uh, finish this discussion and can we go to the next stop? Please? Thank you, sir. Uh, say, am I audible and visible? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so the last part of today's session is my job. Uh, so in next 10 to 15 minutes, I will try to cover the maximum possible indications and methodology about the deltoid and the spring ligament, uh, which is again a very rare thing in foot and ankle to uh, discuss in the webinar. Uh, the importance of the deltoid ligament rupture, uh, if you look at this Hinterman uh, uh, study of JBGS 2000, he has uh, noted that up to 40% of the ankle fracture on scope, they have found that they have the associated deltoid ligament injury. So incidence-wise, we are not talking about the, uh, the rare pathology. So what is controversy about the primary deltoid repair? Uh, if, you, uh, if you ask these uh, questions to uh, 10 people, they will, uh, like, you will get a different answers from all the sites. So uh, because of you know, the histological trend in the fixation, so earlier it was thought that this kind of injury, uh, if you fix the fibula and uh, if you do the syndesmotic screw fixation, majority of your deltoid work will be done. And you may get, you know, uh, the good closure of the medial clear space uh, and no need to uh, repair the deltoid in, in most of your histological trend. But if you look at the recent trends, which is now moving towards the fixation, they said that primary repair of the deltoid combined with the syndesmotic fixation is good for the long term. So definitely we need to look for the long-term studies uh, uh, to maintain the stability of the ankle mortise in, in, in the very long period to, to know the importance of the primary deltoid. And if you look at the uh, recent literature, uh, they have significant subset of the patients who have not treated with the deltoid repair. They, have, they came to uh, the physician with the medial gutter pain and the instability. And this raised the question whether to go for the long-term ankle arthrosis uh, secondary to the uh, chronic medial ankle instability. And there is one more uh, uh, recent, I mean, uh, 2009 JP, I mean, uh, Journal of the Orthopedic Trauma Literature by the Austin Burger and, uh, and his colleague. They have noted that 20.4% incidence of the post-traumatic ankle arthritis uh, in a patient where the deltoid ligaments were not treated in very long follow -up. So why to repair the deltoid? What are the advantages? Definitely, it will help to prevent the non-anatomical healing of the deltoid ligament. This definitely prevent the loss of the peritellar stability, which results in the medial ankle instability, ankle pain, or the increased chances of the ankle arthritis and the hyperpronation deformities. And definitely, if your interest is going towards you know, the total ankle arthroplasty, and you, for that, you need a good uh, medial and lateral collaterals to work uh, for the total ankle arthroplasty. And, and definitely, if you fix the all components of the injury in the ankle fracture, as we have learned from Dr. Sampath sir and Dr. Mar, if you fix all the components of the injury, this will definitely help the athlete to early weight bear and uh, do the early range of motion itself. So, why to repair uh, the set standard treatment for the uh, for the ankle fracture is approximation of the anatomical fibular length. We want the restoration of the ankle mortise and we want the rigid fixation. And the long-term stability depends on the appropriate balancing of the osseous as well as the ligamentous cycle. These are all well known to everyone. So how to assess the medial ankle instability in the ankle fracture? You can go for the physical examination 
you can check whether it is tender edematous ecchymosis medial side but this is not a sensitive sign to to know about the deltoid injury uh, 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 so there are uh, you know the non weight bearing x ray you may miss the deltoid injury so for that you need the emergent gravity stress view uh, where you see the increase in the medial clear space or you get a talar tilt of more than 7 degree to know whether the deltoid is broken or not <clears throat> so again you can move for the uh, advanced investigations like ct or the mri to know uh, the uh, medial deltoid injury and these are you know the various pattern of the injury you can see from the mid substance tear to the talar avulsion to the medial malus avulsion injury so look at a quick example here she was a 35 year old female she had twisting foot injury and this is a uh, gravity stress view which clearly shows the medial clear space widening lateral fibular fracture and along that she had a posterior malus fracture as well so this has undergone the posterior lateral approach i will not go in the detail because this is already being covered and this is how the posterior malus fixation and the lateral malus fixation was done the medial side was open uh, and you can see that the whole of the avulsion the whole of the deltoid superficial and the deep end deltoid they were completely avulsed from the medial malus side this is how the suture put on the anterior colliculus 3.5 mm and uh, through which it is repaired in toto and this is how it looks in post operative so a fixed fibula lateral malus medial deltoid and this is the 6 months follow up with good range of motion the another 40 year old male he has a twisting foot injury similar kind of injury and here you can see the avulsion stress view which is showing the medial clear space of uh, 7.2 cm which is more than 4 mm which shows the syndesmosis injury and the associated deltoid injury so this is also fixed with the same approach posterior lateral fixation and after posterior and the lateral malus fixation still on the avulsion stress view there is a good widening of the medial clear space syndesmotic clamp was applied syndesmotic screw was applied but there was after even after insertion of the screw uh, there was persistent talar tilt on the avulsion stress and this is really very confusing when you are doing in operation theater that how much is too much so how much tilt is too much uh, it's very difficult to uh, to judge intraoperatively because you have already stuck 2 hours for the fibula fixation posterior malus syndesmotic fixation but this is very important if you see any kind of talar tilt after fixing all the components of the injury look at here this was a surprising tibialis posterior tendon subluxation to the medial malus space and complete rupture of the deltoid which was which after opening i really found that this was a true indication of primary opening and repair the deltoid so there are many way to repair the deltoid this is one of the technique transosseous repair where you use even the proline stitch you can use uh, uh, and you can make a small tunnels around the medial malus as you can see on this x ray and you can repair because i was not prepared with the suture anchor i was not prepared for the medial primary repair so this is also one of the technique where you can and this is the follow up x ray Uh, where you can see a good anal motif and a uh, good medial stability and this is how he has walk he walk with uh, no problem so there are some studies which are suggesting the deltoid injuries which are healed uneventfully without any repair but if you look at another subset of the patients they continue to present with the medial gutter pain and the instability and this definitely raises the question of whether those patient would have improved the outcome with the primary repair and primary deltoid repair is very important particularly if i mean it is a absolute indication if the residual ankle mortis instability remains after fixing all the other components of the injury and this helps to prevent or delay the post traumatic arthritis and the medial ankle instability and the younger and the athlete patients they have li little more benefits due to early weight bearing and the good range of motion now another medial stabilizer of the ankle which is my next job is to to talk about the spring ligament now this ligament if you look at the anatomy it is basically looks like a continuation of the talonavicular capsule and the continuation of the deltoid uh, ligaments so many of the surgeons around the globe they treat the spring ligament as a continuation of these two structures but 
anatomically wise, it is separately known as plantar calcaneonavicular ligament, which actually supports that medial teller structures to go plantarly and uh, medially. Let's see how. So look at the uh, look at the uh, the normal ankle here. So this is the normal teller uh, mortise, and this is the uh, the spring ligament which actually supports the medial teller head. And look at this, when the spring ligament is ruptured, it allows the talus to go medially and the plantarly and that may lead to the hyperpronation or the flat foot deformity. So this is a normal spring ligament, which if, it's, if it is tight and if it is uh, competent, you see a good position of the talus. But if it is incompetent, you may see the talonavicular uncoverage. And there are many literatures in, in, uh, in uh, I mean, there are many studies in the literature which shows that even in the flat foot and everything is normal, the tibialis posterior is normal, the other structures are normal. Isolated spring ligament is sometimes, you know, uh, a primary cause of uh, this uh, flat foot deformity. So failure to recognize the isolated spring ligament injury uh, as a primary cause of flat foot deformity that could lead to the inappropriate oper uh, operative management. So spring ligament tear should always be suspected in, in the cases with the clinical presentation of the medial arch collapse, even if it is, even if the tibialis posterior is intact. And sometimes you may need to repair the spring ligament. Let's see how. So, uh, but if you look at the long term, I mean, the long standing flat foot deformity, a tibialis posterior dysfunction, medial dilatation, spring ligament tear that may lead to the overstretching of the deltoid, and which is called a stage four adult acquired flat foot, where you get a further loss of the medial arch due to the failure of the deltoid. So, this is what we see in the cold cases like flat foot. Now, look at a post traumatic injury to the spring ligament and a deltoid ligament in a 23 year old football player who presented to me four days after the injury and if you look at the mri uh, the spring ligaments was completely ruptured from the mid substance he has a severe aversion injury and uh, uh, the deltoid was ruptured from the mid substance and there was a significant teller instability now look at here uh, this is the non stress view of the talus and when I, when in, in during the surgery, when I given little aversion, there was a significant talar tilt inside the ankle mortise, which shows that there is, you know, a <clears throat> classical medial deltoid instability. So this is my incision when I want to repair the deltoid as well as the spring ligament. So you need to start midway from the medial cuneiform goes to the, uh, to the medial part of the navicular. And this is a complete rupture of the deltoid from the mid substance, as you can see here. And this is a repair with a, a 3 mm suture anchor on the anterior colliculus. So this is how the limbs of uh, the two limbs of this, uh, the fiber wire were taken. And uh, the mid substance tear along with the spring ligament was repaired because it was also from the mid substance. So this is how in the post-operative x-ray it looks. So uh, it is very important to recognize, you know, the uh, the the uh, the important medial stabilizers because these are the part of uh, post traumatic as well as uh, uh, sometimes uh, cold deformities like flat foot. Thank you. Thank you, Girish, for excellent presentation. Uh, Sampat sir, any question? Oh, a nice talk and little rare injuries and very nicely has uh, demonstrated that there is a, a definitely a change now in approach uh, for deltoid ligament injuries. Although uh, we see more and more conservative treatment, but definitely there are some reasons why uh, we should uh, repair uh, the deltoid ligament early in its, its role in uh, the stability. Research, uh, now the uh, uh, spring ligament, which you have uh, repaired just now in this case, uh, it was a common uh, particular structure along with the deep deltoid and the, uh, super, the medial aspect of spring ligament particularly, which you have taken as a one sheet and uh, put it back. Is it correct? Yes. And yes. Yeah. So this was an injury where, you know, uh, the hole, as you said, Correctly, the whole medial uh, 
ligament from the talonavicular to the uh, deep deltoid to the superficial deltoid they were alveoles like a single piece yeah. so it was you know a kind of a stitching of all the structure by putting the foot in the inversion so i have used only one suture anchor which uh, which has a two limb where, so i started with the deltoid repair first and then i moved little plantarly where i found a, a, a laxity of the spring ligament uh, and and this the same limb of the fiber wire i have uh, repaired by double bristing uh, girish uh, deltoid is more like a fan shaped uh, ligament yeah. so uh, Uh, is it possible to manage it with a single anchor, or you need more than two anchors? And what are what are your suturing pattern? Because uh, there are high chances of cut out in such acute injuries. Right. So there are you know uh, three different kinds of the uh, deltoid ligament injury. One, if it is from the medial malus avulsion, second from the talar avulsion, and third the mid substance. So in the mid substance, you can go for the direct repair using the fiber wire. but for the uh, for the avulsion injury like as i showed in one case from the medial malus where you have some avulsion pieces also so you have to you you have to bring the whole superficial deltoid and the deep deltoid as a one structure with the fiber wire and then you have to uh, after like 3 to 4 turns you have to bring a foot in the inversion and make a whole structure to the medial malus as a single turn so that gives a very good stability if you take the deep and the superficial deltoid together okay okay but it is very difficult if it is from the talar side and for that really you may require the two suture anchors to get a good control dr ma your uh, way of repairing uh, i i certainly agree that uh, repairing the medial ligament is the way to go um yeah when i you know there has always traditionally been uh teaching to treat it conservatively but whenever i explored i've always been uh shocked at how severely damaged it is and how it, it is actually quite readily possible to repair uh so i think um it's important to do that and also i think that a lot of you know it very bad deltoid injuries to damage the spring ligament as well so we should always think about that at the same time i agree yes sir rajkumar uh, uh, very nice uh, presentation girish i must uh, say that you have put new insights to looking at medial side as a last frontier of you know bringing stability to the ankle repair now as professor mark was mentioning uh, in the old days we always used to manage the medial uh, ligament injuries conservatively so the thought process uh, uh, was it uh, akin to the medial collateral ligament of the knee and does it throw out uh, more fibrosis was that the reason that we treated conservatively in earlier days or any other reason we used to manage conservatively Yeah, so you are right, sir. Uh, like healing by this, uh, the fibrosis was, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea behind the conserving the deltoid injury. But, but if you look at, you know, uh, if you look at the histopathology or the histology of the fibers, so it's you know the whole shattered fiber. So when the deltoid ruptures from the mid substance, they are all shattered. So the healing happened in the shattered positions many times. so uh, even if it is a fibrosis but being a medial stabilizer the strongest medial stabilizer of the ankle uh, the non anatomical healing uh, of the the deltoid by conserving it is a problem on the long term sequel in some subset of the patients so this was uh, you know uh, the, the this was concluded that after uh, many years that if you if you go for the anatomical repair these subset of the patients they really do better because they get a good length and the tension of the tape okay so i think it has been a excellent uh, webinar and uh, we thank uh, professor nick uh, who has to leave for his uh, family commitments uh, thank you dr mark for a wonderful presentation and accepting our invitation thank you dr sampath and see you Thank you sir. Uh, thank you thank you very much.
And thanks to Dr. Thank Sophie. you for inviting me. And uh, I, I, uh, I hope we can meet up in person one day. Yes, yes, sure. <laughs> thanks to Dr. Satish, sir, for making all efforts to make a good webinar. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Dr. Amravati. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.